I'd like to call this regular council committee meeting to order. Before we uh, the land upon which we are located this evening is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Adirondack, and the um, Anishinaabe people, many of whom continue to occupy this area, uh, add to the richness of our community life. And I, I haven't actually a longer um, land acknowledgement that I've been working on and had provided, and I don't have a copy of it here. I apologize. My intention is that as we go forward, that I will um, ask councillors to take turns reading the land acknowledgement because I know that we're all committed to uh, ensuring that we have good relations with the Indigenous community here and that we uh, support the um, efforts of reconciliation uh, in the country. Having said all that, um, would you all please rise for the invocation. We meet to serve our community and endeavor to be worthy custodians of all that has been entrusted to us. Let us be concerned only for what will promote good government. May we bring to our council chamber minds that think and hearts that feel, so that in our deliberations we may display imagination, wisdom, and courage, and the will to do our work for the good of all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, the uh, roll call, please. All members of council are present, your worship. Thank you. There is one addendum this evening. There's a modification to bylaw 59-2023, uh, the addition of um, a schedule. And there's also a deletion of a delegation, uh, Wayne Gates, MPP, and Owen Bjorgen. Uh, we're going to be making a presentation there. They've um, deferred this evening. I have one announcement, and really the announcement is uh, just to touch briefly upon the short-term rental zoning process that we've been going through. Um, councillors have been receiving a lot of emails and correspondence. There seems to be some misunderstanding of where we are in the process, this lengthy process that has taken some time to get to where we are. There was an open house held on April the 18th. That open house provided was the third um, open house with respect to uh, this process, the first being after background research, the second being after options uh, for development discussions, and then the um, third prior to the recommended approach. So that I think it should be made clear to the public that what was at the open house isn't the final recommendation or the report that will be coming from the consultant to the municipality. That's a recommendation that will be provided to staff or a report that will be provided to staff. Staff will then craft a report that will be put before council. That report will uh, have recommendations reflective of what the um, consultant has provided. But we're partway through the creation of a sausage. And to be commenting on or to be expecting that we know what the sausage is going to look like at this stage is premature. So. Um, I just want the public to be aware, people that have been communicating with us on one side or the other side, that we're still in the process of making the sausage. It's not done yet. When the sausage is completed and the report is put forward to council, council will make uh, final decisions. We'll either be accepting recommendations, we'll be modifying the recommendations, we'll be rejecting mod uh, recommendations, so that that uh, is all scheduled to um, come before council May the 29th. And I would um, urge people in the community to appreciate the fact that we, no final decisions have been made yet, and that is still, uh, we're still in the middle of that process. So, um, declarations of pecuniary interest, Councillor Flagg. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Under item 1473-2023, to exempt a certain block in plan 59M488 from part lot control. My son is currently um, a contract for Ashton Homes. Uh, any other declarations? If none, then uh, when we get to the bylaw um, consideration, that's a bylaw that will be removed from the package. Uh, there is one open house that is scheduled uh, on April the 27th, which is later this week. And that's with respect to the town initiated official plan amendment um, regarding the um, issues arising out of Bill 109, the More Homes for Everyone Act. So that's Thursday, April the 27th at 5 p.m. here in the town hall atrium. That takes us to the regional councillor 
report. Good evening, Councillor Encina. Good evening, Mayor Redekop, Councillors, staff, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> At the uh, Niagara Regional Housing Board of Directors meeting last week, we were updated on the progress of the NRH Transition House project at 745 Crescent Road in Fort Erie. The contractor for the project is Van Horn Construction and Niagara Regional Housing has attached our uh, project manager to that to make sure everything goes according to plan. The site office construction, uh, the site office and the construction fencing have been put in place uh, to, and facilitated. The soil has been removed water mains and uh, sanitation sewers are being uh, connected. At this time, the uh, foundations are now being in place. One of the big hurdles that are, it's, it's great to see, it's an accomplishment, CMHC has approved all preliminary funding for this building with the completion date now set for March, 2024. <clears throat> Last year, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing decided to combine three of the social, social programs in the province, the, uh, namely the Community Homeless Prevention Initiative, Home for Good, and Strong Communities Rent Supplement Program into one program called Homelessness Prevention Plan. In February of this year, the, promise, the province advised that Niagara would be receiving $11 million approximately. In order to receive the funding, as you're well aware, um, Staff had to submit an investment plan, get it approved by regional council, and then forwarded to the province. For the last several years, the ministry has been using the population of St. Catharines and allotting the funds according to that for the entire region rather than taking the allotment for the entire region. After many hours de of delivering presentations and lobbying by staff, namely Kathy Cousins, who is a, a focal point, uh, to the ministry and the directors, along with recommendations from the Auditor General, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing has decided that previous allotments were not fair and that we were to be corrected. The region will now be receiving another $9.6 million for HPP. Regional staff will now be bringing forward an updated investment plan. The majority of funds will be going to frontline efforts so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but some will be invested in capital resources, uh, shelters, and other such projects for down the road, not just the immediate, but looking further into the future. This funding is welcome news. Currently, the Niagara region contri uh, contributes 1.7 million of levy funding to HPP, along with another 2.3 million going towards the operation of the bridge housing and permanent supportive housing facilities mainly in the falls. For the information of council and residents, uh, garbage tags will increase from 250 to 285 starting May 1st, 2023. Senior Services is continuing to roll out their recruitment program for volunteers at long-term care facilities. At Gilmore Lodge, volunteers are a valuable and essential part of the care for the residents. Volunteers support a wide range of programs, including mealtime assistance, friendly visiting, helping with cards and games, bingo, sing-alongs, birthday parties, and the list continues. Volunteers truly make a difference in their residents' lives. If anyone is interested in becoming a volunteer, I would ask that you please contact Senior Services at the region or contact Gilmore Lodge to start the process. Uh, as an aside note, I have partaken in some um, with the Knights of Columbus. We've had pub nights that went over really well. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. Thank you very much, Councillor Encina. Are there any members of council that have any questions of the regional councillor? Thank you very much. So we're going to move then on to presentations and delegations. And the first delegation will be Bobby Paunessa, who is a self-advocate mem and member of the Board of Directors Community Living, Fort Erie. Good evening. Uh, it's, uh, this evening, oh, 
Good evening. I'd like to thank Mayor Renekop and the town council and the fellow citizens of Fort Erie for the opportunity to provide information on community living this evening. My name is Bobby Panessa. I'm a self-advocate, and I received services from community living, Fort Erie, and I'm, a, and I'm a member of the board of directors. On the behalf of community living, Fort Erie, we also would like to thank the town of Fort Erie for recognizing May, a community living awareness month, and we look forward to raising a flag Monday, May 1st. The Peace Bridge will also be promoting Community Living Month, lighting the Peace Bridge up blue and green as part of Shine of Light on Community Living Project May 1st. We now like to share a video that describes some the some of the services that Community Living offers. Community Living Community Living Fort Erie promotes inclusion in all services and programs that they provide. I truly believe that all people should be included in their community. We hope you enjoyed this video which outlines some of the programs and services that they offer. The Family Support Program provides support to families and caregivers who have children who are diagnosed with an intellectual disability, a global delay, and are 18 and under. Currently, we provide supports to 60 families within Fort Erie through the program. We provide services and service coordination planning for children and families, such as navigating the school system, initiating referrals based on the child's unique needs, funding resources, and make application when needed. We started our kind of adventure as a community living when we moved to Fort Erie. There are a big reason why we moved to Fort Erie in the first place from Mississauga because they kind of helped us find out that Isaac was eligible for programs we didn't know exist. They really changed Isaac's life and we formed some really great relationships. And yeah, he has, they have great programs, so the camp programs in the summer, the respite programs throughout the entire year, those are the two big ones for him that help get him into the community. Community Living and helped us with the Jumpstart program to help pay for camp, which is extremely expensive. Um, help, that money also goes towards helping to pay for the respite services, um, helping to get us the SSAH and fighting for you know higher amounts to help um, get him into the community programs, get him out with his respite workers to go to the water park or to the zoo or just swimming or, you know, whatever he likes to do. Um, and that's important for us because we came from a city where that stuff wasn't available. And it was a big reason why we came here was after speaking with her, you know, kind of opening her eyes to the fact that these things are available. The residential program at Community Living is where we support individuals in a community setting in a home uh, with 24-hour care and accommodations with day-to-day -day living and uh, completing activities, goals, and uh, supporting their rights and privileges and making sure they're upheld. Same way we help with um, their getting dressed in the morning and meal prep, grocery shopping, taking them out to see family and friends, volunteer and work, um, fulfilling hobbies and goals and making sure that all their opportunities are met every day. Just remembering that the people that live in our residentials programs are letting us work in their home and 
remembering that that this is their space and being mindful of that when I come into work and uh, valuing that it's they have different life experiences and uh, taking that into consideration when I'm working with them each day. It's important that they remember that they're uh, their neighbors. Um, they are they're great people and to remember that they have a gift to offer to everyone and they're worth getting to know. The Passport Program promotes social inclusion through community resources. It started with 30 people involved. We have now grown over 60. And what it's about is to identify activities that are meaningful to the people we support and they're out in the community with one-on-one -on -one staff and the staff are all people that uh, work for our agency. Well the people in the community um, start to see the people that we support out in the community and the people we support develop natural connections in the community whether that's once a week they go polling or they participate in arts and crafts in the community so they develop these natural connections in the community and make friends for life so that has an impact on the person we support and the com community as a whole participating. So we have four full-time staff that work in the uh, Passport program and people that are in the program that we support are people that live independently in the community and people that live in our residential services. There's a gentleman I support or that I did support that doesn't really let his emotions out or talk about his feelings. He's rather quiet. And he had joined the program, he had been participating for about six months. One day we're in the van, once again remember he's quiet. He just turns to me, looks me dead in the eye and says, I love this program and I can't believe that this exists. That was so touching and meaningful as his support worker at the time. It just uh, provided tons of inspiration to do my best in this field. Here at Community Supports, we support people with intellectual challenges to become independent in the community. We teach uh, valued skills in the community. We also do a lot of hands-on training. We take people to the grocery store. We show them how to pick the greatest fruits, the best values that they can get for their money. We also show them where to find foods in the grocery store. We teach them, teach them the self-checkout, how they can become independent and work towards those skills. We have a recreation component where we try to get people involved in the community so they feel valued and also that people in the community get to see us in the community and make friendships and they also have great um, experiences meeting new people and networking. We take them to the Boys and Girls Club where they have swimming and aquafit classes. We also take them to the movies. We do all kinds of extracurricular activities. We support with paid and volunteer placements in the community. We take into account their choices. We ask them and sit down with them what choices they have for the placements they would like to be in. We also take into account their level of what they want to do and how they want to do it. So everybody kind of knows what's going on in Danielle's life and um, when she comes in it really does pick up the atmosphere of the store and customers feel it and my staff feel it and I feel it because Danielle comes in and we have a hug, right? Definitely. We have a hug and everything's great and we're happy you're here. I'm glad that I'm here too. I'm glad that I came because I love my family and I love my work family. That's the main thing and Donnie's been there for me from the beginning so I'm glad that I'm great for everybody. Plus Donnie is amazing. I love him and even the staff here. They're amazing. I'm glad that I came and worked for Donnie at Fortune Edwards. Back to you, Bobby. Oh. Did you have some further comments you wanted to make? I'm good. Okay, great. We'll come to the podium in case any members of council have any questions. <laughs> any members of council have any questions? No, thank you very much. And May the 1st, I think it's 9 o'clock. I'm looking yes. forward to seeing you as we raise the flag. Yes. Ever raised a flag before? Uh, no. Good, this will be your first time. <laughs> I've, I've done it once or twice myself. Okay, <laughs> we'll see you May the 1st. Thank you. Thank you.
That takes us to our next um, presentation, which is Brett Sweeney, uh, Director of Communications for Fax Niagara, and Shirley Matthews, a trustee of the Board of Directors. I'm in Digitally Niagara. Perfect. Now you can see me. Yes, good <laughs> evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for welcoming us to your meeting. Um, I really enjoyed the last little bit there about community living as well. So we're very excited to share some information about Mountain View Lemonade Day for Fox Niagara, which will take place on June 10th. So this is our second annual event, and we're hoping to once again receive your support uh, and endorsement for this initiative. So Brett's going to be my driver. We can switch slides, please, and thank you. So as you mentioned, my name is Cheryl Matthews, and I'm a trustee on the Foundation for Family and Children's Services Niagara. I'm joined by Brett Sweeney, our Director of Communications for Fax Niagara as well. So our foundation has been around for nearly a quarter century, raising money to support the mission of Fax Niagara. We receive government funding for core programs and services, and the foundation exists to raise funds to further support children, youth, and families being serviced by the agency. So the money that uh, we that are, is raised by our generous donors goes to support the programs and services for which the agency doesn't receive government funding. So all those wonderful extras. Can switch slides, please, Brett. So. The really exciting part about our Lemonade Day is that it's about kids helping kids. The idea came from a couple of young people in Niagara who wanted to do something to help other children. And you might recall uh, Mountain View Lemonade Day invites families to set up lemonade stands in their communities to collect donations, and that supports our kids' summer camp programs. So on Saturday, June 10th, a team of kids will set up lemonade stands across Niagara to ask for donations. And thank you to our sponsor, Mountain View Building Group. 100% of the money raised goes to send deserving kids to summer camp, and we provide everything the family needs to host the, the lemonade stands. So just a little quote um, for you. Sorry, I have to see, I can't see my screen. Here. There are so many children in our community who deserve an opportunity to to be with friends, connect with nature, and make lasting childhood memories. So that is from Mark Bassiano, the president of Mountain View Building Group, and we're so thrilled to have them back as a second year for as our sponsor. So we can switch slides, Brett. And um, so our fundraising total that we're looking that we achieved last year was more than $85,000. So what a successful event. Um, and that was from the support of all the families and municipalities, just like Fort Erie, um, that we were able to raise that. So this year, we're hoping for an even bigger and better event to make a positive difference for, for and impact to lives to even more families. So what does $85,000 mean in terms of support? Last year, uh, with that money raised, we were able to give more than 400 children in Niagara a summer camp experience. So this may have included um, sending children to week-long day camps in the region. Um, others got to go out of the region to overnight camps outside of Niagara. And then we also supported foster parents so they could help children that they're caring for on camping excursions so they could take them themselves. And then as we know, we still had the pandemic looming. Um, and for those that weren't comfortable to go away or overnight camps, we provided baskets with things like scooters and sports equipment and other things they could explore nature with just to help kids stay active. So very rewarding um, experience for many of our Niagara families. So this year, um, or as I mentioned, we provided everything a family needs um, to run a lemonade stand. And we did 100 stands last year. 
and we're hoping to exceed that this year. So each each stand, um, if a family registers or kids register, will receive their stand and their banner, t-shirts and hats, the lemonade concentrate, pictures, cups and stickers, and so much more. It was really a fun and engaging time for families, as you can see from the photo there on the slide. So the beauty of this event is that our lovely sponsor, Mountain View Homes, um, is sponsoring the entire program. So 100% of the proceeds goes right to the kids. Uh, there's no admin fees and no direct costs to the families who want to participate. It's 100% funded and 100% of the proceeds go back to them. So we're getting ready to open our registration very soon. Um, anyone can visit the foundation's website for more information. It's there on the screen, backsniagrafoundation.org, or give us a call um, if you want more information. Our goal is really to help make summer a little bit sweeter for everyone, and we're asking all the municipalities in Niagara to help make it a little sweeter for everyone. We'd be grateful for council support and help raise awareness for this event. And if you're willing, we would love June 10th, 2023 to be declared Mountain View Lemonade Day for Facts Niagara. So um, thank you so much for your time and uh, Brett and I are happy to answer any questions you might have about this year's event. Thank you very much, Ms. Matthews. And uh, we do have on the agenda later on a resolution to proclaim June the 10th as Mountain View Lemonade Day. So. We look forward to you being successful on that occasion. Any members of council have any questions of either Ms. Matthews or Mr. Sweeney? Um, I had one question with respect to promotion. How, how are you promoting this? Aside from going around to municipal councils, I presume there's some other ways that you're alerting the public? I'm sure it doesn't mind. I'll jump in on that one. Yeah. Go right ahead. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have a very comprehensive communications plan. It includes, as you mentioned, going to different uh, municipal councils and seeking support. We are also working with our local school boards to get the idea out to local uh, students and children in the area. As well, we will be having a uh, media campaign as well with some paid advertisements, our social media uh, platforms, website communications, email blasts, and uh, various other methods. So we're trying to reach people in as many different ways as possible in the ways that are meaningful for them. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if there are any other questions from members of council, thank you very much for coming out and providing us with some background information. Good luck. Thank Thanks you. so much for having us. You're welcome. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. I'm sure we will. <laughs> um, that takes us to our next delegate, and that is Sam Melnichuk uh, of Han Road. Mr. Melnichuk here. Is he coming in by Zoom, uh, Mr. Patton? Okay, so I'm going to hold, I'll, I'll stand him down for the, for the time being in case he's been delayed. And we'll go then next to um, Linda Goodridge from the Burt Miller Nature Club, who is here, along with colleagues. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, thank you, Mayor Redekop and members of, of Council for this opportunity to speak to you tonight. My name is Linda Goodridge, and I'm a member of the Burt Miller Nature Club and also the Bird Friendly City Bird Team. And a few of our other bird members, our bird team members, are here as well. In October of 2021, Deb Shirk and I made a presentation to Council regarding the Bird Friendly City Initiative. Since a number of you were not on council at that time, I wanted to briefly summarize it and its relevance to proclaiming World Migratory Bird Day in Fort Erie. So if we can start the presentation. Okay, so we can move to the next one. Thank you. So what is a bird-friendly city? It's actually a, a certification standard that was developed by Nature Canada. It involves a checklist of items that need to be accomplished, uh, actions that need to be placed, uh, or uh, 
uh, attended to. And um, when that is completed, there are three different levels of entry into that program. Um, so anyway, it, the, the whole idea of the thing is it recognizes and it celebrates the municipal contributions and the community's contributions in their efforts to try and save birds. It offers a bird conservation strategy framework and it recognizes that birds play an essential role in maintaining resilient ecosystems in our community. And with the current climate change crisis, which we've been dealing with, this is just another way that the community can help to mitigate its effects. Over the past year, our bird team, with the help of town staff, has made considerable progress on researching and documenting various elements of the, the uh, certification checklist. We hope that we can move forward this year with Council's approval and be in a position to apply for the entry level of certification by the end of the year. And by the way, I'd like to mention that Nature Canada had posted a petition on Facebook for the month of March asking people to sign on who favored the idea of Fort Erie becoming a bird-friendly city. And I just got a report today that over 300 signatures were accrued just during that short time. So it looks as if it's a popular idea. Next. Okay, so why certify? What, what's it all about? Well, I've already mentioned the idea of climate change mitigation, but there's other reasons as well. First of all, the whole sense of community pride and honor with this elite designation. It just would make us feel good and, and give us a good reputation as well. We also will receive international recognition and access to a network of communities that are on similar paths. By pursuing this designation, we're also protecting not only the health of our residents, but also the health and well-being of the entire community, including birds and other wildlife in their habitats. And just to put some icing on the cake, there are definitely economic benefits to it as well. You know, we live in a wonderful location for bird watching, with both Lake Erie and the Niagara River within our boundaries. Bird Friendly City will attract even more bird watchers to our community who will spend their money in our restaurants, our hotels, and stores. We need look no further than the town of Leamington just down the way as an example of how bird watching can be a boon to their economy. I'd just like to relate a short story that a, a few years ago we had a rather rare bird uh, come into the Fort Erie area, and it's pictured up there. It's called the brown booby. And it was, uh, it, was so, it was so exciting for birders that we had hundreds of people coming from all over the province of Ontario, western New York, Erie, Pennsylvania, everywhere to see this bird. And birders are like that. As a birder, I can relate to that. Birders will travel anywhere to see a bird that they haven't had a chance to see before. And of course, if these people come from far, they're going to get hungry. So where are they going to eat? They're going to go to our restaurants or maybe go to Sobeys and pick up something to eat there. Um, and if they have a long way to go, they, uh, they may not want to head out at 9 o'clock at night. So maybe they'll look for a place to stay. So there definitely are economic opportunities. Ecotourism is big, and it's growing in the whole Niagara area. Okay, next. Okay, just a few little facts I wanted to throw out. Over 3 billion birds, 3 billion birds have disappeared since 1970. And I'm sad to say that that number is not dwindling. In fact, it's rising um, with habitat loss, with uh, the bird flu that came through this last uh, uh, season and uh, just uh, the storms that we've been dealing with, we, we've really seen a decline in the bird population, which is, is sad. So it's important that we look at ways that we can we can help stop the decline. Um, on the on the bright side, birding as a hobby has increased by 30 percent in Niagara since COVID began. All of a sudden, people realized how wonderful it was to take a walk in the woods and to hear the birds sing, and to see their fine feathered friends as well as their other wildlife around. So, and I think most of us know, in talking to new residents who have arrived here, that people are moving to our our community because of the nature that they find here. And it's important that we try and preserve as much as we can. Now, next, thank you. What I really wanted to talk to you about is um, 
World Migratory Bird Day, and this is an event that is uh, celebrated throughout the globe every year. And recognizing and celebrating this event is actually part of the uh, certification process for Bird Friendly City. Next. Um, the theme this year is water and its importance to migratory birds. The vast majority of these birds rely on resources for all of their life cycles. Uh, it's, it's vital to them for feeding and drinking and nesting, as well as a place to rest and regroup before heading to their breeding grounds. Some of these birds come from as far away as Argentina. They have a long journey and they are always looking for ways that they can rest and, and recoup. So uh, to celebrate this year's theme, the Bert Miller Nature Club is offering birding walks for the general public at one of our public wetland areas. And those interested can email us at bertmillernatureclub at gmail.com for details and to reserve the space. And I'd like to invite any of you who might be interested in learning about birding. To, uh, to join us as well. Next. So finally, I'd like to say we hope that the Council will join us in celebrating this special day by declaring Saturday, May the 13th, 2023 as Migratory Bird Day in Fort Erie. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Goodrich. Okay. By the top of the shoulder, the mayor asked me just to uh, thank you for that and to ask council if anyone has any questions for Ms. Goodridge before she. Yes, Councilor Dubina. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, through you to uh, Ms. Goodridge. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very nice to see you back. Um, I, I was on council during the last term, and I remember, and, and Councilor Butler got to make the notice of motion before I did that, that <laughs> evening to begin. Um, I'm just uh, wondering, I, I, I know you mentioned that, uh, that particular bird that came, and I remember when that happened, and it was a surprising amount of interest. Yes. Um, it really opened up my eyes to just the potential to um, you know, have visitors come, economic growth. I'm just wondering if you know, we're, we're moving in this direction of, of the Bird um, Friendly City Initiative. Have you had a, ch uh, a chat with anyone in economic development or anyone about how we can uh, bridge this together and, and use it as an opportunity, not just to, uh, you know, for, for the, the bird friendly aspect and to, you know, hopefully um, not see as many of them lost, as you mentioned in your presentation, but also how we can use it to grow our tourism economy in, in Forty. I, I think that's a great idea. I was just wondering if you had spoke with them and if you had any thoughts. I, I haven't, but I think that's a great idea as well. I know that there was a, a cooperative a coalition of, of various um, economic development and promotional people who wanted to, we're looking at Niagara, making it a, um, an a ecotourism a, a, a major thing for the whole Niagara area. So uh, yes, I would definitely be interested in, in speaking and, and some of my colleagues as well. And, and if I may, uh, Your Worship, now that you're back, um, if, if it's okay with you, I, I just might uh, even fire off a quick email or something along those lines, if it's okay with you. Sure. I, I think there's some a great opportunity to build a partnership here and uh, do something. So thank you very much for coming back. I'm, okay. I'm looking forward to this moving forward. Okay, thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you. My apologies for leaving. I don't know what came over me, but I, <clears throat> I, needed, I needed some water. Thank you very much, Councillor Flagg, for taking over. Is there anyone else that has any questions? Councillor McDermott. I'm glad to see you here tonight, Linda, and uh, all of your colleagues. Um, one notably missing tonight. Uh, She's going after Rush. a bird. I'm sure she did. I just, uh, I just want to thank you for your work and uh, all of your work on this. And it's, uh, you know, our hope that we continue to uh, move to the touchdown area when we need to. I know it's got many stages, and uh, and um, but it's very important to everyone here that we're taking care of our environment, and our animals, and our birds. So um, you know that I'm behind you, and um, I, I, whatever support you need from me, you'll get. Thank you. Well, thank you, George. And yes, it's true that if we pay, take care of the uh, animals and things, they will take care of us as well. And thank you again for being our, our council liaison. We really appreciate that, and I hope you're willing to stay on in that capacity. Good. Thank you. Any other members of council? Thank you very much, and we look forward to um, continued uh, support 
with respect to the uh, effort to become a bird friendly city. And we will see you on, uh, we're going to be passing a, um, a resolution later this evening, I trust, declaring May 13th as World Migratory Bird Day. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. That takes us to, that takes us to uh, Heather Kelly, Niagara Health Coalition. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Mayor Redekop, Fort Erie Council, staff, citizens, and guests, thank you for allowing me this opportunity um, to speak with you today regarding my concerns over health care in Fort Erie and, in fact, Ontario and beyond. So I know there's a number of people that have a lot of concerns. Um, my name, Heather Kelly. I'm currently working with the Niagara Health Coalition, which is a group of citizens um, that have banded together um, to take a look at health care, um, in particular in Fort Erie, in Port Colburn, and in Welland, the very sites that uh, the Niagara Health System has announced the closure of the Fort Erie Urgent Care, along with Port Colburn, and some of the services from the Welland Hospital that are to be closed. We know that Fort Erie is growing by the numbers of new builds that we have seen in town. The urgent care and in fact what services our Douglas Memorial Hospital or urgent care site continues to supply for the people here and in fact the region cannot be lost. Cannot be lost. We were once told that when the new hospital was built in St. Catharines, that it would cl help clear up all the backlogs that we were experiencing at that time, and that we would, it would provide better service. This is just not the case for so many people unless you're willing to wait for eight to nine hours, and in some cases longer, in their emergency department. And that's only if you can get there. Yet despite the protest of thousands of people at the time, and we know that the council at that time held a public forum so that people would have a say, the citizens in Fort Erie would have a say on the closure of their hospital. Yet despite the protests of thousands of people in Fort Erie, our hospital was closed. But as a gesture, I suppose, we were left with an ur urgent care designation. And we accepted that. We used it. Now we're told that the new build in Niagara Falls will take care of all of our needs. And we'll no longer have, to, we'll no longer have any care in Fort Erie for emergencies or for urgent care needs because we can just travel down the road to the falls. You and I know that while this may be possible for most during the majority of the year, this is not always a possibility in the winter months during a storm, such like we just experienced this past winter, where we couldn't get in and we couldn't get out. So does that mean we're not worthy of immediate care? That we should just make do with whatever means we have to take care of ourselves? It seems to me we need to push back once again against a system that is trying to delete us from the healthcare system. We need to make sure that our citizens are informed and we need to make sure that Douglas Memorial does not fade into the past, remains part of the healthcare team here in Fort Erie. We should not be closing any beds or facilities for healthcare. We hear it all the time, there's a shortage. There's a shortage of people. And I know town council, through our health care committee, has been working diligently to look for new, new doctors so that we will all have a general practitioner. That doesn't resolve the issue of if we require urgent care. Is the doctor coming to our homes? Does not fulfill the requirement if we have an emergency we need to at least maintain our urgent care here in Fort Erie. 
We need to make sure that our citizens are informed. The Niagara Health Coalition is doing that. We're holding a referendum at the end of May so that people will have a say. With the number of senior citizens in our town, we need to make sure that they have immediate help when there is life-threatening condition that requires their the attention, immediate attention. We can't sit back and say we need to call uh, transit on demand to take us to Niagara Falls. We can't call a neighbor to take us to Niagara Falls if there's a snowstorm. We need some place in our town that we can go to get the help that we need immediately. I know that you've been working with the NHS and discussing the health care needs of Fort Erie and the surrounding areas. The Niagara Health Coalition is here to help bring information to our people and we will be asking the people in Fort Erie to have their say through a paper ballot or to vote online May 26th and 27th to determine if they want to keep Fort Erie Urgent Care open. People will have an opportunity to say no. It's time the people in Fort Erie had a say about their health care needs, and we would like to help. We would like the help of council as well with your support for the public referendum. We've been able to have a few of our local businesses supply a space for polling tables, and I have sent you a copy of the brochure uh, that we will be handing out to everyone. And in that brochure, it talks about the referendum in the middle. It talks about who to contact, the Niagara Health Coalition at yahoo.ca if you have questions or concerns. I know that many are facing tough times right now and healthcare is just another issue that people are facing. But that is why we need to speak up and speak out against losing our Douglas Memorial site we need this facility here in Fort Erie for the people here in Fort Erie. After all, this facility at one time was given to our town to provide health care, and our town, through our hospital auxiliary, was able to purchase much of the needed equipment to keep our care ongoing. Excuse me for the frog in my throat. We need the support of the provincial government and this has to be through the NHS. But perhaps this time we can make a difference for our town by ensuring we have the immediate care necessary for the people that want to make Fort Erie their home, both now and in the future. And I know that I didn't put forward a referendum to ask the council for the consideration, but I do have two asks. One, that the council consider the referendum dates May 26 and 27, that you will attend the referendum and have your say in a vote, and that you also encourage the people in your constituencies to also do the same thing. It's time that the people in Fort Erie felt that they are participating in the health care needs of their town. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kelly. You said there were two um, asks. So the yep. first is that council attend, and the second is that we support this. Yes. Okay. So we can ask um, we can ask our communications department uh, through the CAO, uh, who's not here this evening, but we'll ask him about how we can maybe at least get this up on our, our website, which would be of assistance. Um, you're aware that that I, I think you are aware. I'm not sure, but are you aware that the council has a uh, healthcare Services Committee. Yes. And that we've been working with uh, a variety of healthcare providers, including Niagara Health, to address just this particular concern. I understand that you're looking for doctors, right, to come in. Yeah, it's, um, more than, it's more than that. We're, we're also looking at how we can secure primary care and urgent care down the road, um, just so that you're aware. But that doesn't mean that we don't encourage the support of you, the Health Coalition, and certainly all residents in Fort Erie because we know that even 5,000 people coming to a, a meeting, as they did in 1997, as they did again in 2008, doesn't 
necessarily, or was it 2009, doesn't necessarily have much influence, but certainly we appreciate your support. Before you go, are there any members of council that have any questions? Councillor Noyes. Thank you, Mayor Redekop, to you, to the speaker. Thank you for your presentation, your enthusiasm, and go. <laughs> <laughs> All success. I'm just wondering, um, well, as you were talking about making sure that the people know all this. I'm so wondering if these brochures or these flyers are going to be distributed to pharmacies, the doctor's offices, um, other health providers, um, senior groups. Like I know that I, I attend a senior group and there's usually 50 people there, but not all of them have internet. So is there any way that they can like sign something and give their name and their address? And because I would be more than happy to collect them um, at some of the groups that I go to. Um, Absolutely. And also, I would imagine perhaps our communication person will also give us something that we can um, post on Facebook. Um, I know that I, I, on a number of Facebook pages, um, and um, I would be happy to post them and, uh, provide the, and help provide the information. Would that be helpful? That would be very helpful. Absolutely. Um, we do have a sign-up sheet for volunteers, for more volunteers, so that we can continue to get the word out. So we have a number of volunteers right now um, that are going around placing these in doctor's offices and businesses um, locally. Um, we've had a quite a bit of success take up on them. Um, so, you know, any way that we can get the information out to the people, that's what we've been doing. I mean, I, I've done a couple of letters to the editor to let people know in town, you know, that people are speaking up. Um, I, we did, uh, we had uh, information in Niagara newspaper um, regarding the coalition and the work that they're doing. Um, so, yeah, any way that we can work together would be greatly appreciated. But is there some place that they can sign if they can't go on the computer to vote? Like, how would they vote if they don't? May 26th and 27th will be a paper ballot vote. Um, okay, so and the paper ballots will be located in all around town. Oh, okay, so, so paper yeah, um, so it'll be coming out, I think, early next week where the polling places will be located so that people can actually go and participate. I'm hoping to get into long-term care um, so that people don't have to try to travel to get to these locations. But where I can't, then it, obviously they'll be required to go and vote. I still have my yellow shirt. Yeah. So. <laughs> I was really looking for them, you know. <laughs> I still have my yellow shirt. Um, I was a proud member of that gang. I mean, then the gang is the nicest way. We yeah. call the yellow shirt gang. Um, and my trip to... Uh, the, the Parliament, Parliament in uh, Toronto on our bus trip, and I think we had, what, six or seven or ten buses? There were, but Councillor Noyes, this is for questions. Not, not <laughs> so so would, if we do that again, would that be a good idea? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, presumably, Councillor Noyes will make the arrangements. Yes, <laughs> and, and I appreciate Anything it. further, Councillor Noyes? <laughs> further, thank you. Any other members of Council? Councillor Christensen, questions? So uh, there will be leaflets, I hope, that will be going into the public library. Um, the polling place is at uh, fire station number one. So I tried to utilize places where people are used to going to vote. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Any other members of council? Thank you very much, Ms. Thank Kevin. you. We appreciate the, the efforts of you and the Health Coalition and all of your colleagues. Thank you. So I'm going to call um, uh, Sam Melnichuk in the event he's arrived since, uh, since I don't recall anybody coming into the room. I guess he's not here. So we're going to move on and note that he uh, was not in attendance. That's going to take us to the um, consent agenda. Are there any items that anyone wishes removed from the consent agenda? If not, then Councillor Christensen, you have the resolution to move the recommendations uh, and resolutions contained in the um, 
in the consent agenda. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Councilor Noyes. Well, thank you, Mayor Riddick. Um, <coughs> on report number four, CAO 07 LC, the Land Committee minutes. And I, from reading the report and uh, the minutes, it sounds like we're, well, that uh, the, the, um, the person who wanted to purchase the town owned lands adjacent to Hiawatha Avenue is, is going to be denied. Is that correct? That was the recommendation from the land committee yeah. based on the policies that we have. Okay. I'm, and again, I'm, I read the, the, the report a second time, and there was, I, I know that the gentleman who did the presentation, his, his presentation was more about septic and not being able to get a, you know, like that he had reassurances from the Niagara region that he would be able to get a septic permit. So I'm not quite sure if that was initially the the hang up. I know there's there, there's not a house on it, and they don't do do there's not a building on it already. So I'm familiar with that. But did that not have any sway at all that that he could get a septic permit? Well, the problem what the problem was that the uh, adjacent property owner actually had a greater right to acquire the parcel if he was interested because he has a house already on the land that he owns, so that this small strip that the town owned would become married to that. Whereas the individual who um, came to a council last meeting has a vacant lot and wanted to add the town's parcel to his vacant lot, it'd still be an undersized lot. And our policy says that um, we shouldn't be selling it to someone who doesn't already have a house on their parcel. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that, but does the abutting property owner, the one who have perhaps has more pull on this, does he want want the property? We haven't heard that the owner does. Mr. Hurlovich, have you heard anything in that regard? Your Worship, I have not. A again, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to defeat this, but I'm just wondering because one of the big issues was his inability or the question of his ability to get a septic permit. And I understand that there's all kinds of new septic systems in that now. And I'm just wondering, was that approached or did, did he kind of say he could get it and then couldn't get it? Uh, Mr. Hurlovich or yeah. Mr. Waltz, do you know if there was um, any follow up with the region to find out if, if in fact a septic system would be obtainable? Yes, Your Worship. Uh, Mackenzie Cece in our office uh, called the um, Regional Private Sewage System staff to inquire whether any approvals had been given uh, to the applicant. Uh, they reported that they had not received any request from him, that their uh, procedure is that he would have to apply for a special request inspection and, review, and a review fee of $400. So apparently that has not been done. He would need to do that. He may be hesitant to do that since he doesn't own the town land. And so therefore, he'd be asking for approvals on something that he doesn't yet own. Councilor Noyes? Yeah, uh, thank you. I think that's kind of like which comes first, the chicken or the egg. But it's, you know, it's unfortunate. He was very enthusiastic, but I understand the environmental issues also that go with it in setting precedent. Thank you. Any other members of council? Councilor Christensen. So you would direct your questions through the chair, and then the chair will direct them to the staff member. You're forgiven. So you want to know if the, uh, the uh, property owner who was seeking this land was notified what he needs to do at the region? Yes, exactly. I think he led us to believe that he'd been in communication with the region. That was my impression. Um, that's something that, that the individual can do by contacting the regional department, as Ms. Cece had done. Yes, and I'm not, I don't know. Um, I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah. No, no, fair enough. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> so just for the public, on the agenda, there are a number of proclamations this evening, and they range from proclaiming um, May as Community Living Month to a claim, proclaiming a World Migratory Bird Day on May the 13th to um, proclaiming uh, June as Niagara Pride Month and also 
proclaiming uh, April the 28th, 2023 as National Day of Mourning, which is uh, this Friday, I believe. And then there's also the proclamation for, for uh, facts about Mountain View Lemonade Day. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? None opposed? That is carried. <coughs> that then takes us to um, reports. And Councillor Dubinow, you have the first resolution under reports. I do, Your Worship. And this is regarding PDS 35 2023. And it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Flagg. That council approves the Crescent Park Estates draft plan of subdivision dated April 12th, 2023, showing 22 lots for single detached dwellings and two blocks for daylight triangles, blocks 23 and 24, as attached as Appendix 2 of Report Number PDS 35-2023, in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, uh, RSO 1990 um, CP 13, and the regulations thereunder, subject to the conditions contained in Appendix 3 of Report Number PDS 35-2023, and further, that council directs staff to circulate the conditions of draft approval in Appendix 3 of Report Number PDS 35-2023 to the applicable agencies in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act. And further, that council amends the 2023 capital budget to include EDGW23 being the Edgewood Avenue storm sewer connection between Daytona Drive and Lakeview Road at a cost of $80,000 with funding from the development charges reserved for stormwater drainage and control services in the amount of $51,200 and the storm refurbishing reserve in the amount of $28,800. Are there any questions or comments? Councillor Flagg. I thank your worship through you. There's a, been a, a number of emails um, and concerns from residents um, indicating um, uh, a great deal of rock formation in that area. Um, and the one concern um, that has um, been brought up um, a significant number of times is the concern about backfilling to, um, to raise um, the level of land there sufficient for, uh, for building if the um, bedrock is, uh, is too close to ground level. And I'm just wondering if that's something that um, we would entertain or that would be entertained by staff as a uh, um, solution to uh, to bedrock that's very close to the surface. So is that Mr. Hurlovich or would that be Mr. Walsh? Mr. Hurlovich. So you, this you, was dealt with in the report, which was an excellent report, I thought. So your worship to the councillor. Yes, yeah, so the developer would uh, need to provide to the town uh, a master grading plan to address how the uh, storm water issues would be addressed, as well the requirement is that there be a storm sewer that would be uh, provided through this development and uh, so it would come down Shane and uh, connect with the storm uh, trunk sewer. That's the reference to the $80,000. So there would be uh, storm sewers that would be provided in this plan of subdivision. I believe there's also a geo geotechnical report that's required in condition 10. That is um, correct. Councillor Flagg, back to you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and I know that these um, two are linked, uh, the south and the north portions. Um, at what point will the uh, responsibility go to the other um, party? So, uh, for example, there's a requirement for the northern portion to complete work on the south part if the south part doesn't go forward, and, and vice versa, re um, requirement on the south part that the north part um, uh, be completed if that work doesn't go forward. And I don't see anything that uh, indicates a timeline or a expectation that prior to the first lot being um, sold, et cetera, I'm just wondering if there is a time frame that would be included. Mr. Hurlovich? Uh, yes, Your Worship. That work would all be part of the uh, plan of subdivision, so that the drawings would all be approved prior to registration, and then the work would commence um, once the registration is approved. So um, whichever one starts first. So if the northerly one starts first, they're gonna have to extend their sewers through the southerly part and connect with the storm drain. Um, otherwise, in the ideal world, the southerly development will proceed first. Um, 
and the two developers are talking to each other, so I'm sure that they will coordinate that. Thank you, Your Worship. I will reserve comment for the southerly portion. Okay. <clears throat> so, any other members of council? Just to follow up on, on that, then, Mr. Hurlovich, just so that it's clear, th there are similar conditions um, of draft approval for each of these subdivisions, things like the sidewalks on Evelyn, uh, for example, the uh, issue about the stormwater being extended down to the connect with the Lakeview system. So how are how is that being worked out? Because uh, presumably there's some type of cost sharing that's going to take place with respect to these items that overlap? Yes, Your Worship, that's correct. There will be a front-ending agreement that would be prepared by the town and signed by the developers that they would be responsible for front-ending the cost of that work and then as the report outlines, some of that money would be paid back to the developer through development charges. So I know that that's specifically um, relevant with respect to the extension of the stormwater management system. But what about the sidewalks on Evelyn, for an example? It looks like they're both responsible for that, but um, it doesn't indicate, at least I, I couldn't discern, uh, who's going to be responsible for paying that. And so I can see them both jockeying, unless there's an agreement between them, I can see them jockeying to be the last one in. Do you, is there some protocol on that? I don't have the answer to that, um, but now that you bring that up, I will uh, review that with the developers. Um, I don't know, maybe so, Miss Cece is here. She might be able to address uh, council. She's at the back of the chambers. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, with respect to the sidewalk on the north side of Evelyn, I think that's what the reference is being made to. Um, in terms of how it was designed, that would be the responsibility of the northern developer. The condition for within this, the for the southern limits of the development would be only if the northern development doesn't proceed in advance of the south. So that, that uh, sidewalk along the north side of Evelyn would be the responsibility of that of the northern developer, and then if that doesn't proceed, then it would be the south. And, and we will have securities for that from the northern development? Correct. That would be built into theirs, and then if they don't proceed, then it would be built into the south as uh, their responsibility. So that's, um, yeah, so if, uh, I would have thought that these both would be uh, somewhat responsible for the sidewalks. In other words, it's a benefit for each of them. It's a condition of approval for each of them. And um, I would have thought that maybe, and maybe they are working on this. Maybe this is going to be a cost-sharing project for the two of them. Do you know anything about that? I'm not sure of that at this time. It may be a private arrangement that they may work through, but it's not something that the town will be overseeing in terms of that arrangement, but they may have some cost sharing. Okay, and just, um, you may not be able to answer this, so I'm going to ask the, uh, the director. Once the developments are serviced, once the roads are put in and what have you, um, is this a case where no building permit is going to be issued until we know that there's a sidewalk connecting, um, I think it's uh, Parkdale and uh, and Daytona on Evelyn, would th would that be something that we would keep an eye out for? The uh, your worship, we would probably take money as a deposit, so the um, the building permit might occur before the sidewalk goes in. But if the sidewalk is not put in, then the town would have the money to install the sidewalk. It would be part of the securities that we would hold. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions arising out of this? Thank you very much, Ms. Cece. I wouldn't go too far because you might be back on the next one. <clears throat> All right, if there are no other questions, then I'm going to call the question on this particular report. All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Councillor Flagg, you have the next resolution which deals with the southerly development. I do, Your Worship. Moved by myself, sent by Councillor Dubineau. Um, the council approves the draft plan of subdivision for the lands along Shane Avenue, south of Evelyn and north of Edgewood, 
dated April 11, 2023, showing 23 lots for single detached dwellings and two blocks for daylight triangles, block 24 and 25, as attached as Appendix 2 of Report Number PDS 36, 2023, in accordance with the provision of the Planning Act, ROS 1990 CP 13, and the regulations there under subject of the conditions came contained in Appendix 3 of the report number PDS 36, 2023, and further that council directs staff to circulate the conditions of draft plan approval in Appendix 3 of report number PDS 36, 2023, to the applicable agencies in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act. Questions or comments? Councilor Flag and then Councilor Noyes. Uh, thank you, Worship. We're requiring a traffic study um, that will indicate um, traffic at the corner of Shane and Daytona, and um, that if Shane and Daytona, by the traffic study, um, does not allow uh, significant uh, traffic flow, that Edge would be the, Edgewood would then be open um, for access to either Parkdale or Daytona. Um, am I reading this correctly? That if the traffic report says that Shane and Daytona is able to handle the traffic, that the Edgewood Road Allowance will not be open? Mr. Hurlovich? Yes, that's correct. Councillor Flagg. Thank you. And then further, if the Shane and Daytona uh, intersection is deemed not to be able to handle the traffic and Edgewood is open, then will they dead end Shane um, at Edgewood? Um, I think that my fear and the fear of the community would be that it would become a um, an entrance right along Shane very quickly into the um, uh, into the subdivision. Um, so the the question was asked, and it's uh, reasonable in my mind to think that we would then um, restrict entrance um, from Shane um, as a thoroughfare there. Mr. Hurlovich. Yes, Your Worship. What the councillor is saying makes sense. And that, again, is the purpose of the traffic report that would determine which street might um, be closed that might require uh, Jersey bearers because there is an existing house already accessing that portion of Shane. So the uh, traffic report would have to provide those details to the town. Councilor Flagg. I'm just further than the traffic report would also indicate Shane and... Um, and the corner of Edgewood, that would be the uh, expectation of the traffic report, not just the corner of Shane or the corner of Edgewood and Daytona. Mr. Hurlovich. Yes, Your Worship. It would be difficult to address only the one intersection since the uh, traffic would flow right through the uh, intersection of uh, Shane and Edgewood. So, um, so the study would have to address all three of those intersections in essence, the Shane and Edgewood, the Edgewood and Daytona, and the Shane and um, Daytona. Councilor Flagg. That's good with the traffic. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, if I may continue, there was an indication um, by the residents that um, when this first came to previous council some year ago, uh, that there was a stormwater drainage um, pond that was um, in the original draft plan. I don't see that in this one, and I'm just wondering if, in fact, it was there. Um, uh, and uh, just want to make sure that that is not um, uh, something that I've missed. Mr. Hurlovich, are you aware of that? Uh, you have not missed that. The plan is to oversize the storm sewers, and the storm water will be contained or detained within those storm sewers and then slowly released uh, to the uh, Lakeview um, road system. Councillor Flagg. I appreciate all your responses, Mr. Hurley, very much. Thank you. Councillor Noyes. Thank you, Mayor Redekop. I have a f um, one question, particularly, is about the drainage. And one of the comments made on page, what page is this? On page 15 of 19, basically say if, if there is a drainage problem, um, planning staff note that when the private property owners undertake grading and drainage modifications following the assumption of the subdivision by the municipality, any resulting concerns are, are considered civil in nature. I don't think that's the case anymore. I know that we've had a few, and I think we even had a lawyer's opinion. I know this has been brought up for, I know one, one situation on Hill Street and one situation on Hendershot Drive, 
where the town did get involved and did get a lawyer's opinion that they could get involved when the individuals um, changed the grading plan and the neighbors were basically flooded out um, considerably. And um, we did get a, a high, meaning we meaning the town did get a, a reference, a, a, some information from a lawyer to say, yes, we could. I mean, I, I find it hard to tell the neighbor when we are approving these nine-foot backyards, and uh, don't worry, there's a swale um, and a catch basin, you know, three lots down, and, uh, well, if somebody, something happens, the catch basin in one particular instance was filled with cement, um, and that, well, you take them to court. Well, that's, that's not an answer. Um, I think if we can go onto people's properties, if their grass is 12 inches high and cut it down, if we can go on people's properties and um, dirty backyards for all the right reasons and stuff, I think we should be able to go into their backyards and look at their swales to see if they've changed the grading plan or changed the swales that has caused um, hardship to their neighbors. And um, so I don't agree that, that it's a civil matter. You can't. I think to get a lawyer involvement, you need like a $5,000 deposit. Um, and many times it's beyond the resident's um, ability, and I don't know how many lawyers would be interested in it. But again, I will say that in the two cases that I'm thinking of, that the town's involvement did land up with a resolution in both cases where um, the owners did do, I would say, the right thing or worked with each other to control the drainage problem. But to be told it's a civil matter and we're not going to get involved, I think, is the wrong approach. And I don't think that's actually, I think we can get involved, we have gotten involved, and we should get involved when somebody changes, um, you know, fills in a swale or whatever. I do think we have a responsibility to the owner. We keep approving these lots. We keep telling them that their swale is going to take care of it. So just like the weed, the weed bylaws we have in that, we should make sure that we have some... Um, how to say, skin in the game when it comes to people changing the grading plan and causing drainage problems because I know that the, one of the most often problems I hear is drainage, 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 drainage. And to respond to somebody who has lived in their house a few years, or in one case it was 10 years, I think, and in another case it was um, longer than that. But the new house was the problem. He was an old house, it was a new house, the new house changed the grading plan. The neighbors were flooded to the point that they literally, like six inches of water in their backyard every time there was a heavy downpour. So um, I do hope that we do get involved and we don't just say it's a civil matter because, again, town involvement did lead to a, a resolution in both cases. Councilor um, Noyes, you're talking about the second paragraph on page 16. Hang on, now I have to find because my computer likes to turn off. Um, it's the, okay, it's on page 16. It's Second page 15 of 19. Well, it starts on 15, but I think you go down, you're talking about the paragraph it's second the, from the top on 16. Oh, I'm talking about planning staff note. It's right above tree preservation and protection. It's the paragraph above that. If that's what I'm thinking of. I know there's two reports that kind of overlapped. Okay, well... I, I, I got the gist of what you're seeing. Mr. Hurlovich, can you comment on that, or Mr. Walsh, do you want to? Because we've gone through this with respect to including this type of, in, including provisions in the subdivision agreement that could be enforceable by the municipality. So I, I think it's not completely clear that this is solely a civil matter unless we're talking about the municipality having to take civil action, if necessary, to compel compliance with the subdivision agreement. Mr. Walsh? Thank you. So when uh, our former solicitor was em employed here, Jennifer Sturt, and she, uh, one of her first tasks was to uh, look at uh, look at common law and determine what our role is it is in that uh, uh, issue. And uh, essentially it boils down to is if we have a registered plan on subdivision that indicates drainage patterns, uh, we have the we have the opportunity to enforce those unless it's been changed through the will of council. If, uh, if it's an older area, uh, such as Crescent Park, uh, the built form as it exists without subdivision plans and drainage plans, it truly is a, a civil matter. But uh, in this case where we're establishing 
uh, drainage patterns through through the uh, the two developments for this area, uh, we do have a, an opportunity to affect drainage in there. Councillor Noise, and and I'm very happy to hear that because I think that should be our responsibility as the lots get smaller and smaller and smaller, and these swales are so important. And the catch basins are so important to maintain the property, um, not only of their property, but their neighbor's property. The other question is that they talk about a five-year um, uh, storm management, that it's five years. So, and I'm, I'm not saying this tongue-in-cheek. I'm saying, what, what, what five years? Like, if we would take the last five years, we would have had a lot more precipitation than we would perhaps 20 years ago. So what five years, when we say um, we're basing it on a five-year um, drainage plan or whatever. What five years? Because I would really hope that it's the last five years. Thank you. Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, uh, the Conservation Authority develops uh, uh, IDF curves, intensity, duration, frequency curves. And the frequency is the five years in this case. Uh, they are constantly updated uh, annually or is it biannually or semi-annually? Every two years, <laughs> um, uh, with uh, with the most recent data. So that is uh, that is the form we use. Councilor Noyes, thank you. Because then it sounds hopeful that they would have cap captured the change in the drain and the precipitation of the last few years. That's all. Thank you, Councilor Duvernau. Yeah, thank you, Worship, and uh, I want to thank my colleagues on Council for their questions and comments. I, I think. Um, they, uh, they're important issues, and uh, I'm, I'm glad they got asked. But I, I just want to make a comment more in the grand, um, you know, kind of the more of the overarching um, idea of these two um, applications. Um, residents in town may know that uh, typically when we have a subdivision application, we, we have a public meeting. And um, due to, as the mayor has mentioned on any a number of occasions uh, as we've gone on the last few months, um, we don't have a public meeting for this development application. It's because there were no zoning changes. So it's one of the things that the province has tried to do to speed things up. Um, I'm, I'm not going to debate that. We're going to have plenty of opportunity to talk about that. We've got a report coming up on the impacts it's going to have on the municipality. That This is one example. The, the one thing that I want to note, however, is um, that this is going to have particularly large lots. Um, they're, they're keeping the R1 fabric, which is consistent with the, uh, the area in Crescent Park, which where it is. So the, the houses on either side that are already there, the, the lots are similar sized. So, you know, in, in this day where we see a lot of development applications that come in that um, want to increase density, want to uh, do smaller size lots. And, it, and it's understandable, the price of real estate um, and land has gone up in such a way that, you know, to, to make that matrix work, you you have to find ways to be creative. Um, I'm, I'm shocked to see an application like this. I'm not going to say no. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's commendable to see an application that comes in and uses the existing lot fabric rather than trying to change things around. Um, and, and to that end, um, you know, when you talk about compatibility of a, you know, an infill development, um, you know, I, I understand residents may, you know, not, not want to see an open area, you know, have houses and that's understandable, but uh, you, you, it doesn't get much more compatible than this. Um, you've got your, you've got R1 lots, you're surrounded by R1 lots. It's not townhouses. It's not you know the real narrow R2A lots that we are seeing more often now. It's R1 lots. They're going to have big yards. It's going to be three meter setbacks between the house and the property line, which means it's going to be six, twelve, almost twenty feet between each house on the street, which you just don't see anymore. I'm really looking forward to seeing this go in, just to see what a modern um, subdivision looks like with lots this large. It's, it's pretty much unheard of in this day and age. I think it's going to be unique, um, and I think it's going to contribute positively to Crescent Park rather than, you know, go in and change the density in the fabric around. Th those were just some comments. Um, I understand some individuals may see things differently in, in that regard with what we're doing here, but um, I, I can't think of a, a more appropriate way to maintain neighborhood compatibility than to keep the existing zoning. We hear so many times, why are they having so many asks? Why aren't they following our zoning bylaw? This is a perfect example of one that does. 
And uh, those were just my comments, Your Worship. I, I hope I didn't steal your, your thunder about the, the public meeting side of things because th this is just one of the things the province is trying to do to optimize and, and move forward. And, um, you know, I, I, I have my thoughts on that. But for anyone wondering why, th this is why. It maintains the existing zoning. So uh, thank you, Your Worship. No, thank you for um, explaining that. I think that's helpful for the public to be aware. Any other members of council? Mr. Hurlovich, just one um, question. Condition 51, or maybe I could ask um, Ms. Cece, but Condition 51, which talks about removal of trees and vegetation, talks about it being done prior to March 15th or after October, doesn't specify a date in October. Should, that, should there be a day in October, or is it to the end of October, um, no clearing between March 15th, um, or I mean, bef after March 15th, um, or before October 31st. It's on page uh, 28 of the report, but it's condition 51. Ms. Cece? Yeah, I'm just looking at the region's comments. It looks like it should be after October 31st, so we can clarify so, that. Okay, thank you very much. And you'll make sure that that's corrected in condition 51. Thank you. If there are no other um, questions, all those in favor of the recommendations? None opposed, that is carried. That then takes us to um, PDS 37, and Councilor McDermott, you have the resolution for that. Uh, thank you, Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Christensen. The Council approves the amendments to the town's official plan and zoning bylaw as detailed to report PDS 37 2023 for the lands known as 214 Courtway Street. And further, the council directs staff to prepare the necessary bylaws for approval subject to the applicant receiving approval and entering into an encroachment agreement for parking spaces one and two as detailed on appendix two of report number PDS 37 2023. Questions or comments? Councillor Noyes. Um, th thank you. Um, I, I know it's already existing and we're basically uh, trying to what it's used for basically finding the zoning to to match what the current use is. I understand that. But they, they talk about landscaped area that now they're going to take where they used to park the cars, like that driveway is now going to be considered landscaped area. Well, are they going to have to landscape it? Are we going to, is there any expectation that they will or it's just going to be maintained pavement um, as it is now? I would think there should be some condition before we give them any... Um, encroachment agreements that, that that driveway that's now landscaped area as per the, the zoning requirement is actually landscaped area not not the driveway that currently exists that they wanted to park four cars in um, so I would question that before I would approve any encroachment the other thing is that I, I Again, I'm kind of worried about we, we approve this and there, there's some real exceptions of how back, far the backyard is and how the side yards There's a lot of variance because it exists. But I'm concerned about, and I have no idea if this is even in the developer's eyes, but he bought this in 2021. So he, he knew at the time when he bought it, or he should have known at the time that he bought it, that this was not in compliance. I'm concerned that if we make all these exceptions to the rules for this particular development, we may not see that particular building there anymore. It may be basically taken down. He has the site plan approval for, for you know, like setbacks and everything else that are quite minimal in a lot of cases, um, and actually build another building. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about that, if there's anything we can do to make sure that it's not a run eviction that's coming down the street once he gets the approval. So somehow can we tie this to the site-specific, site um, so the current, the, the current building itself? And the other thing, the encroachment agreement, again, they haven't been... Okay, he's saying he needs an encroachment agreement for one and two. Does he not need an encroachment agreement for all four of them? Because he's encroaching... Even the ones that are existing now, he's encroaching on town property now. He he has, they have since since the get go. As far as I'm concerned, it's paved right down to the to the road. So I'm not sure whether we're only talking about an encroachment agreement for I think it's one and two, but we're actually talking about an encroachment agreement for for all four parking spaces. Am well, I incorrect on that? Appendix two shows 
the encroachment for parking spaces one and two, but you had two other issues. One had to do with what's going to be the landscaping area where there used to be parking, which isn't going to be parking going forward, and um, your concern about um, um, this being permitted um, going forward. Mr. Hurlovich, can you comment on Councillor Noy's concerns? Uh, yes, uh, to the councillor through you, your worship. The, uh, the bylaw does allow that landscaped areas can be hard surfaced. Um, I can appreciate what the councillor is saying, that she would like to see some grass there, um, but that's not necessarily a requirement because um, we have all sorts of hard surfaces that uh, count as landscaping. Uh, with respect to uh, parking spaces three and four, I do agree with the councillor that it is paved from the edge of those parking spaces to the uh, street pavement. That would be part of the driveway apron. That would be the same as the driveway in front of your house. Um, and you had one other concern, Councillor Noyes, related to um, the fact that we're going to approve this and you're concerned about something happening or the owner doing something uh, if they get this approval? Can, can you articulate that, what your actual concern was? Well, basically, we're giving them a lot of, um, we're waiving a lot of requirements because it's an already existing building. And one of the reasons we're doing it is because it's a already existing building. But if the existing building gets removed and replaced, do all these exceptions continue on to the new building if it, if it should occur? Mr. Hurlovich, I believe the report addresses that, but can you comment on that? Yes, Your Worship. It does speak to the, uh, the um, amendments who apply to the existing building. We can make sure that's tightened up in the bylaw uh, to specify these um, modifications to the zoning would be for the existing building only. Councillor Noyes? Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, and that was actually discussed at uh, PDS subcommittee. Councillor Dubineau? Yes, thank you, Worship. And uh, that, that actually, that answer was very helpful because I do remember that uh, discussion during PDS. It was a concern uh, shared by members of the committee as well. Um, I, I just want to make a quick comment because this is a, a challenging application because the 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 asks um, in this context are, are very significant, like with regard to parking and and units and and other related things and and. I think the, just going back to some of the discussions we had at the, the Planning and Development Services Subcommittee, the, the challenge we have with this application is that it's an existing uh, building that's being used as a, as a dwelling for, for multiple apartments. And there, there's a level of affordability, is my understanding, to, to the units. They're, they're not, you know, nothing in town is cheap anymore, but they also are not... Uh, a super high-end rental. They're, they tend to be a little more attainable than some of the other rentals we see in the community. So the, the challenge we have now is, yes, this this typically would not be an application that I would be in favor of. And I I, I tend to look at things creatively, look at the way things can work. And, and even I look at this and I say, there, this just doesn't make sense. We, you would never see a, a new application with these requests. And in order for us to bring this property into compliance, allow them to be able to apply for building permits, which uh, may, you know, allow them to improve the building and, uh, you know, provide better, uh, you know, living conditions for the residents who live there. We, we have to find a way to bring this into compliance. And that's what this request is. Um, it, it's, it's it's a weird one. Um, it's definitely one that we looked at with uh, the first revision that came through and we raised a lot of questions. We went back, tried to find things that made a little more sense. I think this is, uh, at least in my opinion anyway, a lot better than what we saw during the information report. Um, but, but this is a challenging one and it's the existing use, it's the existing tenants they have there, the existing units. And the last thing we would wanna do is say no and then we would find ourselves with uh, an, a, a building that isn't compliant and they would, you know, the, the only option at that point to make it compliant 
would be to reduce the number of dwellings, which in turn would mean potentially an individual could be in a, a very precarious situation with their housing accommodations and, and the cost in the market. So I, I agree c completely with where Councillor Noise is coming from. It's just the unique nature of this application. Um, I, I, would, I would prefer not <laughs> to approve an amendment like this, but uh, with it being tied to the building itself, knowing that if that building goes away, the zoning reverts, and with the challenges we have with housing affordability in our community, I, I think, I, I think at least for me anyway, that I, I feel um, we, we, that, that this has to be approved, and I'm going to be supporting it for that reason. And uh, it was just comments, uh, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other members of council? Uh, back to you, Councillor Noyes. And, and I can appreciate, I think, for the same reasons as, as uh, Councillor Dubino said. I mean, I understand that there's four families or five families living here, and um, I would hate to see them on the streets or whatever. But having said that, I would hate to see them on the streets because of rent eviction also. Um, so anyway, um, so I am going to support this. I'm just hoping that we're doing, I know we're doing it for all the right reasons. I know the encroachment agreement still has to come forward. I don't think we're agreeing with that. And perhaps in the encroachment agreement, we can ask for a little bit landscaping or whatever as a give and take, so to speak. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Noyes. There being no other questions, I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor of the recommendations? That is carried. That takes us to new business and inquiries. And Councillor Noyes, you have the first resolution. Yes, yeah, seconded, seconded by myself and seconded, I mean, moved by myself and seconded by Council McDermott, that in accordance with the requirements of expense allowance policy bylaw number 142-06 as amended, Council authorizes Wayne H. Redicott, Mayor, to attend the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence City Initiative 2023 Annual Conference on June 6 to 9th, 2023 at the Chicago Marriott Downtown Magnificent Mile in Chicago, Illinois. Are there any questions or comments? It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> Councilor Mc, McDermott. Uh, are you going to uh, take a side visit to Smoke Daddy's in uh, Wicker Park? <laughs> it's a um, great place for ribs. I, maybe you want to bring us back some? I would, I would only do that if it didn't take me away from the important work that the Great Lakes Cities Initiative is going to be <laughs> undertaking. And I, I might not be able to get there. I'm, I, I could send away for it, I suppose. Of course. <laughs> Does this influence your vote? Of course. <laughs> You're hoping. Okay. I'll, uh, I'm going to put that down on my list of things to do in Chicago. Uh, all those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. Councilor McDermott, you have the next resolution. Thank you, Worship. I've moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Christensen. The council alters the meeting schedule for the months of May, June, and July as follows. May 8th, council and committee. May 16th, uh, Tuesday special council meeting. May 16th, 6 p.m. council and committee meeting. May 29th, regular council meeting. June 12th, council and committee meeting. June 26th, regular council meeting. July 10th, council and committee meeting. And July 24th, regular council meeting. Are there any questions or comments? Councilor Noyes? Thank you. If this is approved, and I know this is hopefully not too big of an ask, can we perhaps get a new calendar? I'm sure that the uh, clerk could arrange for that. Uh, yes, we will be issuing a new calendar. It will also be on the website, and when our executive assistant returns from a conference later this week, she will be sending out new invitations for your personal calendar in Lotus. Uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. We won't be changing it. Um, okay. So the next um, the next resolution, Councilor Lewis, which you have, is actually was actually brought forward to us from uh, another municipality, and there are a number of municipalities that have um, supported changes to the municipal oath of office. We consulted our um, indigenous community here, and they suggested uh, the changing of a word which we've incorporated, and that's why we didn't support the resolution that came to us earlier, which is under correspondence. We've created our own uh, by making that change. So, Councillor Lewis, over to you. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Flagg. Whereas most municipalities in Ontario had a have a native land acknowledgement in their opening ceremony, and whereas a clear reference to its rights of Indigenous people is the aim of advancing truth and reconciliation, and whereas Call to Action 94 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada called upon the Government of Canada to replace the wording of the Oath of Citizenship, to include the recognition of laws of Canada, including treaties with Indigenous people. And whereas on June 21st, 2021, an act to amend the Citizenship Act received royal assent to include clear reference to the rights of Indigenous people aimed at advancing Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action within the broader reconciliation framework, and whereas the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada outlines specific calls to action for municipal governments in Canada to act on, including education and collaboration. Now, therefore, it be resolved that Council requests the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing um, that the following changes be made to the Municipal Oath of Office. In brackets, I will faithful I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles the Third, and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada, including the Commission, which recognizes and affirms the Indigenous and Treaty rights of First Nations, Inuit and Metis people, and further that Council that this resolution be forwarded to the Honourable Stephen Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Association of Municipalities Ontario, Wayne Gates, Member of Provincial Parliament, Tony Baldinelli, Member of Parliament, and all Ontario municipalities and the Fort Erie Native Friendship Centre. Thank you. And Councillor Lewis, just for clarity, it is observe the laws of Canada, including the Constitution. I disagree with that. Okay. That's good. Any questions or comments? All those in favor, none opposed, that is carried. That takes us then to the next item on the business, which uh, Council McDermott relates to the Bridgeburg BIA. Thank you, Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Christensen, that Council appoints Nicole Laura Hollertel to the Bridgeburg Station Downtown Business Improvement Area Board of Management for the period ending November 14th, 2026, or until a successor's appointment. Are there any questions or comments? Just want to make sure, Madam Clerk, that we've got the proper spelling of Ms. Lirondel's last name. Um, but I'm going to call the question on this since there are no questions or comments. All those in favor? Unopposed, that is carried. And um, Councillor Noyes, you have the next resolution. Thank you, Mayor Ritterkopf. Move by myself and second by Councillor Dubineau that Council appoints Gary Kutstra to the Accessibility Advisor Committee for the period ending November 14th, 2026, or until a successor is appointed. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. Councillor Christensen, you have the next resolution regarding the Ridgeway BIA. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Lewis, that Council appoints Kathy Bailey, Karen DiBiase, to the Ridgeway Business Improvement for the period ending November 14, 2026, or until their successors. Are there any questions or comments? All those in favor? Unopposed, that is carried. We have a response to an inquiry that had been raised by Councillor Noyes with respect to um, an update on the broadband situation in Fort Erie. Mr. Walsh, I presume that you, you'll refer to this um, uh, response which was circulated to members of Council? Yes, I'll, uh, I'll paraphrase the key points, uh, Mr. Mayor. That would be fine. Thank you. Um, so in response to the, uh, the, the question from the uh, March 17th uh, council meeting regarding an update on broadband activity in Fort Erie. Um, it's been a, an ongoing priority for council and was identified in the 2018 through 2022 strategic plan. The town established broadband committee to help facilitate and promote broadband expansion in the town. The committee has met several times with telco companies active in the Fort Erie area. 
broadband rollout first takes place in densely populated areas. This supports financial business models and allows quicker return on capital outlay. In Fort Erie, this has been the case. Most areas within Fort Erie's urban boundaries have uh, broadband access. Um, major grant opportunities have been put forward by the provincial and federal governments to support expanding high-speed internet throughout the province and country. The town of Fort Erie through the region of Niagara is part of the Southwestern Integrated Fiber Technology Project, aka SWIFT. Uh, the primary target areas of Fort Erie are along the, the Parkway and Point Abano area. Uh, work along the Parkway has started but is stalled pending an archaeolog archaeological uh, assessment. Uh, stage three assessment is planned to resume as soon as ground conditions allow. The hope is to have that study complete by late June or early July. Uh, this portion of the build would service just under 300 homes. Work is currently underway in Stevensville and Ridgeway. Through this program, approximately 400 <coughs> homes were provisioned with broadband last year, with numbers ramping up significantly this year. Uh, roughly 3,100 will be serviced by the end of 2023. The first delivery of 700 homes in, in Stevensville and Ridgeway is expected by the end of May 2023. The town will continue to communicate with the telcos and advocate for underserviced areas in Fort Erie. Thank you. Councilor Noyes, does that adequately address your concerns? I, I do have a question, but yes, I think, and I really appreciate the, the response. Uh, I've had a lot of people asking, particularly on the parkway. Um, I will say that the, the reason given for the last, I think, almost two years, if not longer, has been archaeological, and they're saying, well, how long does it take? I mean, they, they keep hearing the same thing, the archaeological, archaeological. That's why you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, and it is important that, that, that we look at that. But the, it has been the reason given for, I think, over two years now. So they are getting somewhat um, frustrated with the lack of service there. And um, But I am glad to hear that, that we're aiming for the, I guess, late June, early July, that hopefully... The, at least the study will be complete, and then they'll hopefully go fairly quickly to install the, um, the broadband. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else to the inquiry? Councillor Dubineau. Yeah, and it's, it's more of a, a comment just for public information. Um, the, the inquiry did mention that uh, there's currently the, the deployment going on in Stevensville and Ridgeway, and uh, I've had an opportunity to go by and, and look at what's going on. Um, if you're on Prospect Point Road right now or down in through Ridgeway by the lake or areas in there, you'll notice you'll notice um, the, these machines that actually go in and they trench underground. They don't, they don't dig a trench, but they go under. And you'll notice the, these holes that they've dug and they have construction fencing and then the coils of uh, orange conduit. That's all part of the fiber deployment that's going on. Um, it's actually going on right now, I believe, on Stevensville Road, down in through, uh, I'm just saying, uh, Carver and Hill and kind of in through there. Um, much of the, uh, the core area of Fort Erie um, on this end of town, as well as um, even other parts of Ridgeway and Crystal Beach have already had it. Um, I think it's really good to see it moving forward. Hopefully, once we have this sorted out, we can get more access out in the rural areas. Um, actually, if you're out in Wayne Fleet or any of those areas, they, they've actually got fiber to the home in many areas now, to the farms. It's, it's pretty impressive what they can do now, and, and the costs have come down considerably from where it was when they first started. So um, that was just more information. If anyone's curious to see what it looks like, how it goes underground, how it goes above ground, it's actually really cool what they do. And uh, anyone who's curious or, or wants to get an idea of what it looks like before it comes to their neighborhood, uh, go, go take a look. And you know, it, it's 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 pretty interesting the way they do it now. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this item? If not, are there any other items of new business or inquiries by members? Councillor Christensen. Uh, through you, Your Worship. I would like to make a motion to waive Council's rule of procedure to allow for a motion to be presented, discussed, and voted on without notice. The motion that I am asking Council to allow me to bring forward is to propose the lifting of the current moratorium on licenses for short-term rental accommodation in the Town of Fort Erie as follows. Okay, that so that's going to come under notice of motion. and. Um 
You can raise that under notice of motion and you can uh, make your comments and then I will I'll, we'll deal with it then. So it comes under notice of motion. Okay. Anyone else wish to, um, Councillor Noyes? Um, yes, I, I, driving down the road of, past our LCBO trailer, I see a sign, actually two signs, that basically say renovations. And they're going to be closed for a short period of time. So I'm somewhat curious what they're planning on doing. I don't, they're, the ground hasn't been broken. Are they going to increase the size of the trailer, change the trailer? Like, do we have any idea? Three, it has to be moved it? in order to accommodate construction. So the trailer, that temporary trailer will be moved further south um, for a period of time while the site plan is finalized and then construction starts on what is supposed to go where that temporary trailer is right now. Okay, that, that, that explains the sign. And I also have a notice of motion, but I'll wait till that okay. time. Okay. Any other inquiries or items of new business? Councillor Dubina, then, you have a resolution under motions. I do, Your Worship. Let me just make sure I have the right one here. And I'm looking. Yes. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Flagg that staff are directed to prepare a report with recommendations on amendments to bylaw number 21705 that include the following enhanced enforcement measures to establish a mandatory registry of companies that engage in door-to-door -door newspaper circular delivery to homes and businesses within the municipality as well as the agents who deliver such items to require the registration number of the company and the delivery agent to be affixed to the newspaper circular or the delivery bags when they delivered to the home or business, to establish a progressive administrative monetary penalty structure applying to both the company and the delivery agent for violations that include, but are not necessarily limited to, the incorrect placement of newspaper circulars when delivered to homes or businesses within the municipality, failure to display registration numbers on the items delivered to homes or businesses within the municipality, fail to register as a company or an individual delivery agent in the municipality and that um, and exempts newspaper and circular deliveries by Canada Post or regulated courier from mandatory registration so long as they exclusively utilize those methods of delivery and further staff are directed to notify Metroland Media who are the owners of Niagara This Week, Fort Erie Post and other da Niagara Daily Papers, the Fort Erie Observer and the Port Colborne Wayne Fleet Monthly of the changes proposed by Council for any comments to be included in the subsequent report and if I may your worship I'd, uh, I'd like to speak to that. Yep. Um, I, I think it's pretty obvious to most residents in town why I, I brought this forward. That's why I didn't have a preamble. Um, I, I thought uh, I had quite a few of those long-winded ones during the last term, Your Worship. I thought I would spare counsel this time, um, and I would just cut to the chase. Um, I, I think every single member of council on any number of occasions has had a call from a resident who has had a snowblower blow up in their driveway um, due to a, an incorrectly placed newspaper that has not been seen, covered in snow, and then run over. This has been a challenge that we have been trying to deal with I think years is an understatement. This has gone on for multiple terms of council that go on even before my time during council. And I want to extend my appreciation to Bev Bradnam. It's my understanding um, she's on holiday right now. She's our manager of strategic initiatives. She has been trying to work very hard with um, the, the one particular company that, from what I've seen, continues to do this. And... Um, it, it seems like we can't gain agreement on a way to resolve this because it continues to happen. And it continues to happen over and over. And it, it's like whack-a-mole. You, uh, you, you deal with one delivery agent, then another one shows up, does the same thing. Um, you, you, even stopping them, you know, on the street. And, and you know, you, you talk with individuals, they try to explain the bylaw. It's their community. They see someone doing this. They try to say, hey, what the heck are you doing? And those conversations don't go well. It, it's just they're told, well, I'm, I'm told to do this, and I'm going to do it. My hope is that with this, and I'm not looking to, I, I, I'm not looking to create a, an overarching regulatory framework. I'm, I'm just trying to, to find a way that we know who is delivering newspapers door to door in our community and who is doing it so that when we do have a complaint come in, 
it's no longer a you need to catch him in the act you you need to you know a burden of proof situation by putting registration numbers on um, and and you can print off a simple label just has the numbers you can print off dozens of them and, and just slap them on those blue bags that they they use um, then this way we can track down who's doing it and I would prefer not to have to do something like this I would prefer that the rules get followed everyone is happy but your worship I uh, I came to work on on Friday um, the newspapers go out on Thursday and uh, you know anyone who knows my store I've got a front door I've got a mailbox right next to it and we have our parking lot right in front and lo and behold there's a newspaper on the parking lot six feet away from the mailbox so they're supposed to deliver it to the mailbox the mailbox was right there and it was right next to the mailbox on the ground. Councillor Christensen and I earlier today attended a, um, a, 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 a um, an AMO training session on asset management. And as we were coming back home on uh, on one of the rural roads, there was probably a dozen newspapers sitting on the end of a driveway that just hadn't been cleaned up. That's a property standards issue. But I, I look at it, you know, you have elderly residents, you have, uh, you know, people who might be away for periods of time, they just pile up. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, maybe we don't have to go through with this, you know, I'm asking for a report for staff to engage the companies, we may be able to rectify this issue before we need to go any further. But I think we need to take action for residents. It's costing them money every time they blow a belt on their snowblower. Um, it's, it's, it's making our community look dirty on a, on a Thursday morning, Thursday morning again, when the bags are left there, individuals don't clean them up because they're frustrated. And I'm, I'm just doing what I think is a carrot approach to try and encourage these companies to comply with our bylaw and to know who's delivering the papers before we get out a stick and say that maybe we need to ban this entirely in our community and that would be truly unfortunate. Um, the, the exemption under section D as many individuals know, we have two newspapers in Fort Erie that are delivered by Canada Post. One of them is a Fort Erie paper, and the other is a Port Colborne Waynefleet paper, but it also delivers to Shirkston and, and rural areas of Stevensville. Never had a complaint about them, because it goes in the mailbox. And maybe if these blue bags ended up in a, everyone's mailbox, we wouldn't have a complaint either. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that staff can engage, staff can bring forward a report, look at some ways we can tighten this up, because it's just been going on too long. And I'm... I'm I'm tired of the number one complaint that I hear from residents in Ward 2. Um, maybe it just shows how boring Ward 2 is, but, but the number one complaint that I am receiving now are people who are frustrated that no one is listening to them when they, essentially they say these companies are littering on their property. So that's why I'm bringing this forth, Your Worship. I hope Council will support this to at least get a report looking at some options for some more discussion. But I think it's a discussion we need to have, particularly before, as the saying goes, the snow flies. So uh, that's, uh, that's what I have to say, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Councillor Dubonau. Anyone else? Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and through you to uh, Councillor Dubonau, thank you for bringing this, this matter forward. Um, I know it's certainly something I heard on the, the election trail um, back in October. Um, you've certainly made a gentleman on, on my street that's quite elderly happy because he looks at this as weekly assault. He never asked for them, never wanted them, and they just keep coming. Um, I do like the approach that you've taken. We're working with staff. Maybe we can try and address some of these concerns through, through conversation. Um, but I support the recommendation you, or the motion you've put forward lately. Councillor Noyes. Um, thank you, Mayor Rinnikoff. Uh, and I, I, I totally appreciate the, the thought behind this and we're getting a report. And I will say one thing that was not brought up when, when the Accessibility Committee brought it up through Bev Bradman, I would say four or five years ago. Um, and it was an accessibility issue because we had a gentleman, we have two gentlemen at the time on our, on our committee, both had vision impairments and both were tripping over the newspapers, um, and, and one was an older gentleman and actually fell a few times um, trying to walk over 
Like he couldn't see them, so and his, if, if if his cane didn't hit it, he wouldn't know it was there, and he was tripping over it. So that's where the accessibility committee got involved, and that's how uh, Bev got very involved. I will say, we have tried the carrot approach for many years. Bev has been, I think, somewhat. Um, I'm sure she's somewhat frustrated, but I think it may be time to hit them over the head with the carrot because I don't think you're going to get any compliance with the newspapers um, that are delivered. And Stevensville does not get the Observer, just to let you know. We don't get it. Um, but I wish we did <laughs> through Canada Post. Uh, but anything that we can do to improve the situation is wonderful. But again, we've tried numerous times, and but we never thought about the idea of you know, registering on the on the thing to have a contact person. But that contact person... I know Bev's contacted the, the different owners, and they, they change. It's like whack-a-mole, as you said. She gets some compliance from one agreement, and then that person gets replaced with somebody else who doesn't agree, and you start, the, you start it all over again. So I do hope that um, we have some success with this, but I am somewhat reluctant to, uh, to put any money on it, to be perfectly honest. Thank you. Councillor Dubineau. No, and and uh, thank you for um, thank you, Worship, and uh, just uh, through you to to Councillor Noise's point, I I, I I I tend to be of a similar mindset. Um, I'm I'm trying this. It's a little bit of a bigger carrot, um, maybe a, a carrot we can hit them over the head with. Um, but my my next thought process, as I said, would be the stick, which is basically we then need to look at, uh, you know, maybe prohibiting entirely and I and I think that would be a shame because home newspaper delivery has always been like a you know an, an important thing um, but then at the same time we have other newspapers that are delivered by Canada Post so I I, I see both sides I just want to say really quickly your worship I uh, I had already thanked Bev Bradnam um, our manager of strategic initiatives for all the assistance that she provided and the input on this I also have to thank um, Jim McCaffrey our bylaw coordinator we had some really good dialogue Dialogue about what enforcement takes place now, the challenges they have, how we can tighten that up to make it a little easier for them to enforce, as well as uh, Carolee Grummet, our um, manager of uh, economic development. I didn't have a chance to speak with her too much about it, but uh, if we're talking about registration, it's probably going to be economic development that's impacted. Um, I'm not envisioning even a, a registration fee or a licensing fee or, or anything to uh, you know try to make money off this. It's, it's just to know who they are so that we have a record and then we can follow up. And if someone else throws a paper but it has someone's registration number, well, you know... That that's uh, that's kind of the uh, you, you got to make sure the people you have working for you are uh, are doing the job you hired them to do. But uh, again, I've I've uh, probably spoken more about this than I have uh, some of the long-winded uh, motions I've had in the past, Your Worship. So uh, thank you very much. Anyone else, Councillor McDermott? <clears throat> Just one thing, uh, Your Worship. I know that uh, the Port Area Observer probably doesn't get out to Stevensville, but. Uh, they go to uh, they go through a lot to um, send this out by the mail, so you know you just picture that the mailing is cutting into the profits, but they're doing it so they don't have this problem. So uh, I just want to say that I've never seen one of those out in the lawn at all. Never had a complaint about them. I'm not sure why they're included here, but uh, just wanted to make that uh, known. Councillor Noyes again. I just wanted to mention, I've also, I can get the observer, and I will say they have gotten a system where we know where to pick it up. There's one at the uh, at the Meridian Credit Union and one inside the uh, the pharmacy and things like that. So we do know where to get them. And so, you know, and I do agree with uh, Councillor McDermott. It's, I think it's a wonderful paper, and I do enjoy reading it. But, again, it's just, I just wanted to correct, we do not get it delivered by Canada Post. I don't think Crystal Beach does either. I think you have to pick it up. No, you're, I see Joan shaking her head. Yes, you get delivered. I heard it was Crystal Beach and Stevensville didn't get it. So, well, regardless, that's yeah. beside the point. <laughs> um, anyone else? Councilor Dubin, I'm just wondering whether the word include, which is at the beginning of the third sentence, whether that would be more appropriate if it was considers, so that you haven't already determined all of the things that are going to be included. Which. Uh, third line in the um, motion so that 
No. Okay. Staff are directed to prepare a report with recommendations on amendments, blah, blah, blah. That considers the following as opposed to that includes the following. Oh, uh, yes, Your Worship. If um, It's up to you. Yeah. No, that, that's all right to clean it up. Are you okay sure. with that as yeah, a friendly absolutely. amendment? Okay. Okay. Yeah, friendly amendment. Everybody clear on that then? Okay. If there are no other questions or comments, all those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. That takes us to motions. Councilor Christensen, you said you have a motion. Yes. Um, Notice a motion. I'd like to make a motion to waive Council's closed procedure allow for a motion to be presented. So, Councillor uh, Christensen, I'm going to rule that the motion to waive the procedure is out of order. I'm going to allow you to bring the notice of motion returnable May the 29th because there's nothing that is compelling here that would require this to be done without notice. A in point, of, view. point of order, Your Worship? Sure. Um, isn't that for Council to consider if it's compelling now to waive the rules? So, I, I, make, the, um, I make the ruling. And if the ruling well, then I'll challenge the ruling. Yeah, yeah, and that's fair okay. enough. And that's, that's your right to okay. challenge the ruling. So to finish the ruling, um, my ruling is that the motion to waive the rules is out of order, that your notice of motion would properly be returnable May the 29th. Councillor um, Dubinow has challenged the ruling. And so, Madam Clerk, I don't believe there's discussion on that, is there? I think there's a simple, straightforward it's, vote. Yeah, it's, it's simply council decides without debate. Right. So the, the challenge is that my ruling is out of order. So we're going to vote. If you support my ruling, you vote yes. If you don't support my ruling, you vote no. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. Beg your pardon? Can you do that again? Yeah. If you vote yes, you support my ruling that waiving the rules is out of order. This motion should be returnable May the 29th. If you don't support my ruling, you vote no. Okay? I'm going to call the question all those in favor of the ruling. Opposed? Okay, so that means we can proceed with a motion to um, waive the uh, rules of procedure so that you can bring forward your motion. So the motion then is that we waive the rules of civil proce rules of procedure to permit you to bring a motion this evening without notice. That's what's on the floor. Everybody um, clear on that? Councilor um, Noyes? Just a comment. Um, I think, Councilor Christensen, I don't think you have your mic on. Sorry, I, I put it on. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm bad. I'm sorry. Okay, so is everybody clear on what the motion is? It's whether we, it's, it's to waive, so it's a motion to waive the rules. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So do you want to put forward your motion then, Councillor um, Christensen? Yes, Your Worship. Uh, whereas one of the town's key priorities is promoting business, economic growth, and employment opportunities, and whereas one of the town's major business sectors is tourism, a sector that depends on visitors coming to and staying in the town, and whereas accommodation for visitors is largely provided through short-term rentals, and whereas council set up a pilot project to determine effective approaches to managing short-term rentals using a licensing approach with a number of licenses capped at 250, and whereas council subsequently decided to conduct a land use study on short-term rentals to be completed by December 22nd of 2022, and whereas council set a moratorium on new licenses pending completion of the study by WPS Consulting, and whereas completion of the study has been delayed with the information report projected to be considered at the May 29th, 2023 meeting of council, 
And whereas the moratorium is likely to continue throughout for another summer, thereby restricting the business of tourism in the town, and whereas this is not consistent with the town's priority of promoting business, economic growth, and employment opportunities, therefore I move that the Town of Fort Erie Council approve the removal of the moratorium on short-term rental licenses on May 8, 2023, at a time deemed appropriate by staff, that staff be directed to follow the process for allocating licenses in place prior to the moratorium, that the number of licenses be capped as originally determined by Council at 250, and that this plan be revisited upon Council's consideration of the options and recommendation short-term rental land use planning study and decision on the matter. Okay, so we're going, to, we're going to adjourn for 10 minutes so that you can make a photocopy of that so that people, the members of council, will at least have it. The clerk will have it. Uh, and uh, we'll reconvene at 820.
Question, Councillor Christensen, you've put the uh, resolution on the floor. Did you wish to speak to it? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> On, I've, I've uh, observed the, uh, the process with respect to um, short -term, the management uh, of short-term rental accommodation in Fort Erie over uh, the past couple of years. Um, I uh, have been approached by uh, one side in the issue uh, extensively and um, have listened to stories over those years um, particularly from uh, people uh, looking to use short-term rentals or to offer the services. Um, I, I, would, I went to part of the first open house uh, and, and had questions, um, or to the second open house, I missed the first, uh, and I sat through the open house uh, on Tuesday, April the 18th. Um, and I realized uh, that there are essent that regardless of the decisions with respect to the um, short-term rental planning study, um, there is a significant issue uh, affecting uh, the businesses in Ridgeway and um, the businesses in Crystal Beach, possibly other parts of our community, um, because we we. Uh, Following COVID, we still have tourism down, and we do not have um, the opportunity to offer people places to stay, to come here, spend time, and, and uh, um, frequent our businesses and su support them in maintaining viability, um, being sustainable, which is what we've all been looking to, um, certainly through and post-COVID. Um, I, I looked at it and thought, this is an issue. We are not going to make a decision on um, whatever way we go till May 29th. Um, depending on that decision, there will be other um, successive decisions or uh, that either uh, council or staff have to make in terms of the, the overall uh, future of short-term rentals, uh, wherever they may be located. And I thought that... Uh, one of the things to do, the one thing that should be done is to separate the moratorium from the larger um, question uh, in order to not lose another summer. Um, and so that was why I decided that I would make this motion um, on that basis. So keep it narrow. It does not, um, I, I don't believe it has uh, significant Im implications um, for the the overall study. It will do what it does, and it will inform us, and we will make our decision. But I really think that um, as the governance body for this town, we have an obligation to a wide range of interests in this town, um, including businesses, um, uh, people using, uh, who, who use short-term rentals for a variety of reasons, operators, and uh, people who uh, in this town may indeed welcome short-term rentals. So I tried to look at the larger issue. Any other members of council? Councillor Noyes and Councillor Dubineau. Thank you, uh, Mayor Redekop. Um And I can understand this is a um, <laughs> testy issue. I do think this motion basically flies in the face of our motion last week, was it last week or the week before that was defeated, um, in regards to moving things up to May, uh, you know, skipping the third meeting and moving things up and, and hurrying the process. But having said that, I, I have to have a question, if I can, for Councillor Christensen. If a new license is issued before Council makes a decision, like the, we lift the moratorium and new, new licenses are issued, um, and when the decision comes down that council supports and where they should and shouldn't be. What happens if a new license that's just been issued is in a place where council decided it shouldn't be? What happens to those licenses? Councilor um, Christensen, did you want to address that? They, they would become legal non-conforming uses, um, I would assume. Um, that's, uh, and that, that is, is perhaps a downside. I think that the in the greater scheme of things, given that we are so far under the cap, 
um, that, uh, and given the amount of time it will take for uh, new operators to generate or operators uh, who are ready to go but need to apply and comply, um, I decided, I believe that that is not as significant an issue as might be thought. Um, if I can continue. So if I understand that currently, according to Councillor Lewis in the earlier discussion, we have 120 short-term rental licenses, right? That's my understanding, so probably 120. So um, I guess my question is, increasing this from 120 to 250, more than doubling it, is not considered significant change or not a significant impact? Um, through the I mayor? Just, <laughs> I, through, you, through you, Your Worship. I, I, do not, I do not think that we're going to have that kind of an uptake. I think there are some people ready to operate. I don't know that there's another 125 or 110 that are ready, up and ready to go in the time frame. What it does is permit some people who missed the moratorium uh, or, or got caught by the moratorium just as a matter of timing. There are a number of people who were not only ready to go, but the moratorium just truncated the process and they would have been approved. So this is, it's, it's uh, I don't think it's a huge number, but I think it is, again, the, my priority is to move things forward because we have uh, businesses that are in, uh, in my ward uh, have told me that they have lost about 40% of business, um, partly through COVID, but it continued last summer. I'm trying to look at ameliorating that. Well, is back to you. Um, yes, um, in, in response to that is that we had, I don't know how many new businesses starting up in Crystal Beach and Ridgeway Primarily, I think that's where the, the most new businesses, I don't know how many, 41, 62, whatever. I know I've gone to a number of open houses last year and this year, so I, I question your data because I don't really know if you actually have data. And you've also mentioned that you only heard one side of the issue. I'm wondering, what about the other side of the issue in regards to people who don't want short-term rentals? Besides, that's the whole purpose of the whole study is to get public input, et cetera, et cetera. And... And again, it's like throwing a monkey wrench in the whole process. And you are correct that if they get a license through this process, there will be a mad rush for the licensing because they don't know what the land use study is going to say. And you're going to find every, everyone who has the least bit of interest that I may want to running to, to make sure they apply for the license. Um, and so I, I think you're... It's naive to think that this is not going to have a huge impact, not a minor. It's going to be a major impact in how the, this program has been rolled out. Slow, yes, absolutely slow. Um, I would all like to see it faster. But um, we already know where the air, okay, we don't really know, but we already kind of know the recommendation of the study, those who went to the open houses. So those who are outside the recommended area, are going to be very, very proactive in getting their license for an area that they're pretty sure won't be approved once the land use study is approved, if, if we approve it with the, with the recommendations. I think the mayor mentioned earlier today that we're going to get a study come to us. We may agree with it. We may disagree with it. We may agree with certain parts. We may disagree with certain parts. We would modify it, et cetera, et cetera. This basically says, screw the study. We don't really care what, uh, what the recommendations are, where they should and shouldn't be. We don't really care about the public input. We really don't care about any of this because we're going to go ahead and issue up to 250 new licenses here, there, and everywhere because, because and you're, you're blaming it on saying because tourism needs it, but again, tourism is doing quite well, I think, and we wouldn't have seen all these new businesses. The other question I have is, the steps required to get a license is going to take more than a month. <laughs> like by the, by the time you have all the inspections done, have you discussed this with the fire department? 
to see if they can go and do all these inspections for all the applications? Have you just, has this been discussed with the EDT, the Economic Development and Tourism section? Do, do they have the, the manpower of their staff to run through this? Have you discussed this with bylaw? Have, because this is a huge staffing issue. Um, so again, those are my comments for now. You can, through you to the mayor. Councilor Dubineau. Yeah, thank you very much, Your Worship. And uh, I, I think it's just important to point out, I don't think any member of this council is naive. We won elections on the, uh, the, the groundswell of support that we had in the community based on our platforms and uh, our support for various interests. So I would never say that about a member of council. I don't think any of us are naive by virtue of the fact that we're here. We are not naive. We know what we're doing. Um, the, 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 the important point that I, I want to mention is the cap was set at 250 because that was a number that we believe that the market should have based on a, a number that has existed historically in this community. And due to the moratorium, and, and I'm of the opinion this has gone on way too long. Um, you know, we, we should have had this dealt with before summer, and we're headed into May. And frankly, on our first post-COVID um, tourism season, and with all due respect, Councillor Noyes, you may want to check your facts, tourism has done absolutely horrible in this region since COVID. We have seen the number of short-term rentals drop due to that. This is our first post-COVID tourism season, and this week, uh, April 24th for the next week is Tourism Week. And by all accounts, um, talking to tourism operators in the region, they're expecting a banner year. They're expecting us to see at least the same, possibly even a higher level of tourism in the region. And as we know, the tourism areas in this region are centered along the Niagara River and, you know, Niagara on the Lake, Niagara Falls, Fort Erie. We're, we're expecting that. And quite frankly, we don't have anywhere to put people who come to this community. Um, this is not about the land use study. This is not about any of our opinions on that. This is about the moratorium and the fact that through attrition or whatever else, we have lost, what, around 100 short-term rentals with no ability to reapply. Some residents in this community may, I don't know, like that because we put a moratorium in place and then we put a study in place and then we limit. Perhaps that was their intent. I, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that for others to decide. But frankly, as a member of this council whose salary is not only paid for by the homeowners in this community, but also the business community, which also includes the owners of short-term rentals in this community, they pay property tax. We may not be happy about the amount of property tax they pay, but they still pay property tax. They're rate payers in this community. They have a, uh, a right to be heard by their council and to have issues deliberated. This is not a one-sided issue. I don't think Councillor Christensen is looking at this at one side. I think she's looking at it from a wholesome perspective as a councillor trying to balance the reality that we don't have this report ready in time for our first post-COVID tourism season. Um, for whatever reason, uh, you know, I wasn't here for the meeting, but I think there was an attempt to try and at least get the report on the agenda sooner so we could start the discussion. But let's be honest, when this report comes to council, the fact that we have a, you, we, we, we can count votes, we can see the split here. There, there's a difference of opinion on this council. This is not going to be resolved on May 29th. And I've been through this during the last term. It'll be deferral after deferral, information after information, and then next thing we know, it's going to be Labor Day, and we're going to have 140 short-term rentals, and we'll have just lost the first post-COVID tourism season that we have all been waiting for to start to see maybe some uh, more activity down in Bay Beach. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of activity, but we're not where we should be. There is a lot of economic activity being left on the table because of this. And I understand that there are certain residents who have concerns. This is, in my opinion, primarily an issue of noise and nuisance. And that is something that we are going to have to discuss, and we may have to bite the bullet and pay for when this goes forward. But the fact remains, we started at 250. If all of those operators were still in place, we would still have 250. So if we have a mad rush back to 250, it's just back to the status quo. It doesn't change. They could be all over town. This changes nothing. And as far as I'm concerned, when something does not happen as fast as it should, and when you, maybe not through, and maybe not intentionally, maybe just due to priorities and, and due to the availability of staffing, but when things get dragged out in a way 
that harms a group of taxpayers in our community. And you have another group of taxpayers who feel differently. You know, you, you got to look at the harm and you got to look at the money being left on the table and you got to look at this from the entire context of what summer 2023 is going to be. And in, in my mind, um, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, um, I, I, I say this cautiously, but you know, it's having to explain to individuals that we still have a moratorium in place going into May 2023 and we haven't made a decision yet, it, it's embarrassing. Um, you know, that this, this looks like amateur hour, unfortunately. And, and I'm not saying this to disparage anyone. I, that is not at it at all. It just happened this way. And now we as a council have to find a way to make it good for a situation that unfortunately has just not gone the way it should have. And I think the one way that we can do this right now is to ensure that we have adequate accommodations in our community for the tourists who want to visit here this summer. And there are a lot of individuals who will come here, they'll visit Niagara Falls, everywhere else, it's nice, it's quiet here, um, and I think we're leaving, I just, it, it flabbergasts me as, as, as a business owner in this community that something got dragged out this long, right into the season where it's crunch time. And so I, I look at this as a matter of desperation. Um, we really don't have much of a chance to, you know, sort this out. And the only way I look at it, it's under the existing framework. It's under our existing bylaws that council previously passed. All we are doing is lifting the moratorium, going back to that, and then once we sort this out, we sort it out. But, but frankly, to anyone in the community who's listening right now, um, this dragged on for way too long. We lost 100 short-term rentals, or thereabouts, because of this moratorium and the attrition. And uh, as much as I'm sure some people are celebrating that, there's a lot of people in this community who are very angry that that had happened. So I, I wish that this had gone differently. I'm not happy that we're at this point. I am not celebrating this at all, but I think we have to do this. And um, that's why I did what I did tonight, and I didn't enjoy it. But um, I think this needs to get on the floor, and it needs a discussion, and we have to make a decision on this. So thank you for indulging me and allowing me to speak, Your Worship. You're a councillor, you're entitled to speak at a council meeting. Anyone else? I would just like to respond factually. The people that I referred to, Councillor Noyes, were some of the leaders of the most um, opinionated um, anti-short-term rentals. So I wasn't exactly swayed by that. Uh, the existing businesses are hurting. I talk to them. Some are doing well, some are not. The new businesses, yes, they're opening, and I think that's wonderful. But we've seen businesses open and close. In Councillor McDermott's ward, the Green Apple was one example, and it's closed now. Um, there, have been, there is one, the lonely guy in um, Ridgeway is closing. Big Pappy's in Crystal Beach, closed. So we have new businesses. We don't know how successful they're going to be because they're new. Um, finally, with respect to the, your point about um, the explosion, yes, our staff will have to um, ramp up the, their previous practices, um, and I leave it to them. They are best able to do that. They will have to manage that. I trust that they can manage the process, and yes, it will, it will be like restarting um, something that has been uh, uh, lying dormant for a while. That's, that's what happens when you shut things down. If, you know, if it were a boiler, you wouldn't be starting it again very soon, but in this case, these businesses, some of them are able to do that. So, so that's, you know, we can do that. Uh, but they will be assessing the eligibility for licenses. That will take time. It won't be overnight, but we can maybe save some of the summer. And um, so it, it's, I, I think that uh, while I respect your points, I, I stand by my, and I have been thinking about this for months. So this is not short term. I made my decision on my position a long time ago. 
Councilor McDermott, can I give you can you I give you the chair? Pardon? <laughs> Did you say do you get to give it back? Is that what you asked? <laughs> you can after we're done here. So if I may hand the chair to you. So, um, Councillor Christensen, it's, it's, I don't doubt that this has been something that's been weighing on, on your mind, and it's too bad that you didn't um, apprise us of this before um, 7.45, the night of the council meeting, when you wanted to move this motion forward. Look, this is a tough issue. This is, this is the most challenging issue that this and the previous council have dealt with, I think. And um, it's pretty clear that it's, it's going to be a challenging issue all along. The reason, um, I've got a couple of questions that I wanted to ask, and I, I think I should ask um, Councillor uh, Christensen, the first paragraph, first substantive paragraph, when you talk about the approval, approve the removal of the moratorium on May the 8th at a time deemed appropriate by staff, what does that mean? Um, on May, uh, just that it be removed on May 8th and that uh, staff may not actually get to it at, at 8.30 or 9 o'clock, so it may well be that it's 10, you know, 10.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, this, there, there are obvious, as Councillor Noyes has pointed out, there, is, there are significant implications for staff uh, in various departments. So, uh, Okay, so if I might, what, from what you're saying is at a time deemed appropriate by staff isn't really necessary. This moratorium, if this resolution passes, is to um, be lifted May the 8th. Yes. So why don't we just take out the words, if I might suggest, why don't we just take out the words at a time deemed appropriate by staff? If that's if that's agreeable yes. to you and yes. your your seconder. Yes, okay. it's agreeable to me. Yeah. The reason the reason there was a moratorium is is solely for one purpose, and that was to cre crystallize where short term rentals were located within the town while we engaged in a zoning process. The reason being that we had been advised uh, that. We were putting ourselves in jeopardy of creating non-conforming uh, properties um, if we made changes to the zoning down, down the line. That may or may not be true. It may be that um, we, we're not creating um, existing non-conforming uses um, having regard to the fact that they're not currently permitted in the zoning bylaw number one and number two. Uh, there may be some latitude because this has been approached as a pilot project. And Mr. Hurlowich, I don't know whether you can respond to this, but um, if we continue as a pilot project, um, is it still possible that we might have some protection from the creation of a non -exist, uh, an existing non-conforming use? Or is that a legal aspect you maybe prefer not to weigh in on? Uh, Your Worship, it's my belief, and I believe the councillors have already spoken to this, and that is if we license a short-term rental in a location, a zone, which in the future we would not, um, council might not approve for a short-term rental, that use would become legal non-conforming um, by virtue of being established before the zoning bylaw was brought into play. Okay, so I know that there's some differing legal views on that, so I'm going to suggest an amendment to the, to the motion, and this amendment um, may uh, help us in the future, or it may not, but the, the amendment that I would propose would be a fifth paragraph that says that no new license issued before council determines the zoning study will grant any property owner existing non-conforming uh, use status uh, as the issue of short-term rentals continues to be dealt with by dealt with as a pilot project by the town of Fort Erie. So I don't know, as I said, I don't know whether that provides uh, any legal insulation for us on the one hand. On the other hand, I think at least voices uh, are concerned that if we are concerned about potentially creating existing non-conforming uses, then at least this addresses that particular point. So okay. it would... So 
if you're agreeable to it, then that would be a friendly amendment, yes, if sir. your seconder is agreeable. You, you don't even have a seconder yet. Well, that would be okay. okay. So then... Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I so, think that's, Madam Clerk, that's, I will, that's good. I will... You want me to read this again? Okay, so the amendment would be that no new license issued before council determines the zoning study will grant any property owner existing non-conforming use status as the issue of short-term rentals continues to be dealt with as a pilot project by the town of Fort Erie. So my concern, my concern continues to be that if this holds no weight, we will be creating new locations which will be non existing non-conforming uses if they're in areas that we determine shouldn't be zoned for for that use and that's really that was really the purpose of the moratorium uh, and and it was the purpose of the moratorium not because I thought this was going to go on for two years but it seemed rather foolhardy to be creating zoning areas which um, in which short-term rentals could not be permitted and yet thwart that as we're going through the process. And we're not through the process yet. Um, it's unfortunate that we're, I would have anticipated that this was something that would have been dealt with on May the 29th. So we're a month away from May the 29th. I'm um, apparently more patient than many other people. But uh, okay. um, so in any event, I'm, look, I, I, I hear the arguments about business, I get that. Uh, there are some areas in, in the community where they want as many um, business, uh, many customers as possible. I get that, and that's a benefit to the community at large. I also, in terms of the zoning, think about the fact, and we've heard this in connection with our, our applications for the zoning amendments, that people rely upon zoning. They rely upon where they live, that this is what can happen in these particular areas. And when you buy a house, uh, in a, in a residential neighborhood, a lot of people are, are, aren't contemplating the fact that there's going to be a commercial use for the property next door. We have unwittingly perhaps created some of those in areas that we don't want them to be. Um, this runs the risk that we're going to create more. Um, for that reason alone, I wouldn't support this, but um, if, if I can minimize what I consider will be the damage, then I, I guess that's that. I just think that we're, we're, trying, to, um, we're trying to gauge um, what the sausage is going to taste like and look like before it's finished, and I, I don't think that's a good idea. So I, I won't support it, despite the fact that I appreciate, Councillor Christensen, that you've agreed to the, to the amendment. I, I won't support this. So, uh, Your Worship, then... Um do we, uh, okay, is it time to speak to the amendment then? It's a friendly amendment, so it's part of the amendment. Okay, the so we're good. Then you can add the chair back. No, no, no. You keep, keep it, it until the end of, of this debate. Okay. Uh, Councilor Lewis. Yeah, just a question to the friendly amendment so I understand correctly. Um, who would that allow a license to be created for if it's not for a new license? Anybody, no, it would be, so if somebody's already got a license, they may be an existing non-conforming use, or they may not be, depending on the interpretation of the law. All I'm saying is that perhaps this paragraph will insulate us from any new applications, because since the moratorium was imposed, there have been no new applications. So we'll know what a new application is. It'll be anything that doesn't currently exist. So, and if I may continue on that thought, so how does that help filling the 250 licenses that the previous council set as the cap that I think Councillor um, Christensen's motion is speaking to. Sorry? Your amendment. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand here, and, and maybe it's because it's 849 as well. Um, how does that allow for the cap of 250 to potentially be filled based on new applicants if new applications cannot get a new license? No, it doesn't say they can't get a license. It says that if they get a license, they're not going to be considered an existing non-conforming use. Got you. Got yeah, you. So they, yeah. It, okay. in, in no, fact, no, no, no. And that's grandfather. why I ask questions when I don't understand something, because there's no point in writing on something that I don't understand. Um, last question I had with respect to the amendment 
With respect to legal non-conforming, it's my understanding that legal non-conforming is tied to who owns the license. So if the property sells, does the new owner of the property not require um, a new license? No, the, u the use goes with the property. Okay, thank you. And those are my only comments. Uh, Councillor Dubinow and then Councillor Noyce. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, through you, thank you. Um, I, I want to thank Mayor Redekop for bringing this forward because I think it helps to address the biggest concern that doing this would have on the community, which is, and, and Councillor Noyce touched on it. If, you know, I, I, I was mentioning before we already had them. But there's been some whittling back, you know, maybe people who didn't have them, you know, there, there might be some concern. So I really appreciate this, and that's why I support it as a friendly amendment. I don't know if it's going to have an impact on the, the legal aspect, but if we can put that down just to mention that council's intent is to proceed with this, I think that's entirely appropriate, and I do um, very much appreciate the mayor uh, doing that. It's it, it wasn't even something I envisioned during my uh, um, tempered concern <laughs> that I raised, um, but I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I think it, as much as I know, I think I know the way the vote's going to fall on this. I, I hope anyone out there watching, um, anyone out there who's listening, realizes that this is about the situation now and about how the situation has gone and where the unique situation we find us in this summer. And, uh, you know, we, it's, 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 it's competing interests. And I don't say that in a negative way. There's just lots of things to consider when you're sitting at this horseshoe. You've got business owners who have a certain opinion. You've got residents who have one opinion, some residents who have a different opinion, and then another resident who has a third opinion. So it, it's, it's very difficult sometimes for us to mesh it all together, to find that compromise of how to make this work. Um, I just wish this hadn't dragged on as long. I, I really wish we had had this sorted out earlier on. We wouldn't have had to do this. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult on the planning side right now to do anything, as anyone on, on the planning and uh, development services committee knows. Um, I just think we now need to do something to kind of um, rectify that issue that is been outside of our control with how long this has taken. So Mayor Redekop, thank you very much for proposing that. I, I hope the concern out there in the community for anyone um, sees that and I'm, I'm happy to support that. I think that's more than fair, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Councillor Noyce on the amendment. Um, oh, I thought we already. Oh yeah. So the amendment. Yeah, okay. okay, go ahead. Um, okay, I, I guess my one question is on the last point it says, and that this plan be revisited upon council's consideration um, which plan? Um, the, the plan, the plan to um, remove how uh, accept uh, applications for new. Currently, we don't have a plan. We have we have for for um, dealing with the, the situation we find ourselves in other than that we are waiting for the report, depending on the, the, the decisions and comments um, that are likely to occur on the, the report, um, if they then, if that will then go to whatever recommendations, whatever decisions we make for implementation, there will be further coming back um, with respect to potential um, amendments um, to both the uh, bylaw and everything else. It will take a lot of time. So it's a matter of given an end date, so it's, it's, uh, it's we aren't going to just leave it there. And, and again, just thank you, Your Worship, for um, ensuring that uh, it, it sort of reinforces there is an end date for that, so that, and it depends on the decision of council on the larger <coughs> policy issue. Um, That's what it's about. Okay, it's okay, protection. okay. I, <laughs> I hear you. I, I still don't quite get what the plan that you're going to revisit, um, although it's the entire situation that's going to be revisited. I don't think you're you're putting forth a plan that's being revisited. Well, the plan is. To lift moratorium, the plan okay. is, this, is this motion. 
Okay. Moratorium. Okay, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna argue. Yeah. Anyway, so in other words, okay, this, that you're that the only thing that you're thinking about for this motion is to revisit the the moratorium 250. So in other okay, I just wanted to 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 get to get that straight. Um, I guess my other concern is some of the comments made by some of my father counselors. I know this is a hot topic here and a hot button topic in that um, I, I get concerned when someone minimizes the impact of short-term rentals in a residential area saying it's it's bylaw, it's noise and nuisance. It's a heck of a lot more than noise and, and nuisance. There's a, And talking about we don't want to harm, um, I guess, the short-term rentals people that are taxpayers. I also don't want to harm the residents who bought their house in a neighborhood and want their neighborhood and their feeling of of community changed because of short-term rentals. Um, it may or may not be. I, I, I agree that there are places that it's appropriate, and I agree that there are places that are not appropriate for this, and that was the whole purpose of the land use study. And this, again, I mentioned it before, throws a wrench in that, because we may get licenses in areas that none of us would have agreed that that's a good place for it. But since we have no land use planning, they can go anywhere um, in the Fort Erie, and I don't think one size fits all. I don't think, I think there are places they should not be, and there's places that they should be, and that was the whole purpose of the land use study, which we're now kind of going around. Um, but um, again, um, I knocked on enough doors. I know that they don't want them. 95%, if not more, do not want them in Stevensville, do not want them on the parkway. I don't know how many are on the parkway already. I hear that there's a number of them. It was going to be one of my questions to, uh, to EDT, to the Economic Development. How many are currently on the parkway? How many are currently outside the recommended area? I don't have that number. Do you know that number already? Do you know that number? Okay, because if... I'm assuming the planning report, the planning report has, has diagrammed its options, but the, the, the actual numbers. Okay, so okay, so you don't know, um, you don't know when you're putting forth this motion where they should go, where they shouldn't go, or where they are. That's so nice. I'm this sorry. is about the moratorium. It's not about... Well, yes, but that's part of the moratorium. If there's... There's a moratorium, and then there's the planning report. They're separate from what we're talking about here. No. Yes, it is. It is. Okay. I'm well, not going to argue the point. <laughs> but, but anyway, I think it's, it's all about where they're going to go. Um, and again, I would like, it's unfortunate that it came kind of an 11th hour that we don't have staff's report on how, how this is going to affect their manpower, everything from the fire department to the bylaw. It's, you know, we're just throwing it, throwing it in the air. Um, each license requires inspections. Each license requires A, B, and C. <clears throat> how, how is that going to happen? Like, what, what's it going to do to say, well, we trust staff that they'll, they'll be able to step up to the plate? And I would think that they they will try whether they're going to be successful. And I think it puts a huge burden on staff at an eleventh hour to say, okay, we can have up to we have 120. We can have we can double that number, um, and they have to go through the process. So um, I am concerned about the way this was brought up, but again, it is it's on the floor right now, and. Um, it's unfortunate that the public didn't know this was coming up tonight either, because I think we would have had some responses and some delegations. But I won't say anything else on this. Uh, Councillor Lewis, and then uh, Your Worship, did you want a, another kick after Councillor Lewis? Just very briefly. Okay. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, um, Councillor McDermott. I've been sitting back here um, writing down a lot of things that I've heard, some of which I'm not going to speak to because I think some of my other colleagues have, have mentioned it quite uh, eloquently. Um, I do agree with the mayor's friendly amendment and think that that will be most helpful to alleviate some of the concerns for those who are concerned about the um, legal nonconforming with respect to uh, short-term rentals. 
A um, couple of comments that have been made is that everyone has a right to be heard, and, and I do agree with that completely. Um, there may even be a war, an award at the end of this for how much we've consulted with the community in terms of how long this has gone on. I think it's probably one of the longest consulted um, pieces of policy that probably this council has ever taken the time to look at, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I've been very open and transparent with the electorate leading up to the um, October election, which saw me sitting in this seat some 20 years later. One thing that remains unchanged is that I do believe that there needs to be a middle-of-the-row policy taken by this council that respects the individual rights of those who choose to call Fort Erie home, but also those who choose to call it their, their cottage and look for ways to um, keep that cottage within their family. Um, not everyone that lives on the Niagara Parkway or the uh, waterfront is immensely wealthy. I've met a number of people who the fact that they can afford to keep those properties in general is because of being able to, let's say, sublet it for, um, for um, financial purpose. I do believe strongly, and I've said this right from the beginning several years back, that I don't believe any one individual should have a way of negatively impacting another individual's quality of life. But to me, whether it's owner-occupied, tenant-occupied, short-term rental-occupied, industry, commercial, agriculture, or whatever zoning it could be, um, we need to have bylaws in place that deal with those problems. I am a little concerned that we have a, a bylaw in place right now, whereas after 11 p.m., there may not be a lot of controls to be able to make them be able to do their job successful. And maybe that's what we've learned coming out of this is we need to put some more skin in the game or look at some more creative ways to follow up with enforcement um, because I do believe enforcement is key. And, and I do sympathize with those who have had a negative experience because of a short-term rental next to them. But I can also say that I know of many in the community who have had permanent residents in their neighborhood <coughs> or next to them where life has not been quite as, as rosy as one might think. Um, Councillor Noyes, you mentioned about um, Councillor Christensen and how she came up with with her data. I know you mentioned in Stevensville, ninety five percent of the people say they don't want them. I don't know if you actually know that it's ninety five percent. I believe there are concerns, um, and that's shared throughout the community. And I think it's on us to <clears throat> listen to all sides take our collective experience in life and our years in the community and make a decision that's going to be the best for our community moving forward. And I think that's why we're all here. This is not personal. This is an, a very serious issue that Council needs to deal with. And as Councillor Dubino mentioned, we are now coming into another tourism season with no plan. And Councillor Noyes, you mentioned um, to Councillor Christensen about how this would impact staff, and most certainly it will impact staff. I think our staff are doing a fantastic job <coughs> trying to navigate a system that they have not created, that was created by those who share the great fortune to sit around this horseshoe. But at the same point, I think they're perfectly capable and competent of being able to do it. My question back would be, if the land use study report, which is separate from the moratorium, <coughs> were to come back on May 29th, how are staff any more ready then than they are now to move forward with enforcement and licensing? And the answer is we don't know because we haven't come up with that. Um, I think these are some, it's a very tough decision to make, um, but I think it's on us to make tough decisions. And um, being elected to council doesn't always mean that the decision to make everyone happy is the best decision. It's have you done what you could in a balanced, open, and transparent manner to make a policy decision across the whole town that each and every one of us are sitting in a zone where they could or could not be for the benefit of the whole community. And, um, and those are my only um, comments. So thank you, Your Worship, for the friendly amendment. Thank you, C Councillor Christensen, for moving this. Um, and I know my BIA um, will be quite happy that this came up for discussion. Um, and ultimately, um, we will see where the land use 
the study report goes when that report comes back to council. Um, but I, um, I'll, I'll yield my comments now. Thank you. Your Worship? Yeah, just, just want to make it clear, because it's now been repeated several times, that the moratorium is distinct from the land use study. It's not distinct. It's the reason, the, more, the reason there's a moratorium is because we decided to embark upon a land use study and we didn't want to exacerbate a system where we might be creating more existing non-conforming uses in areas that we might decide we do not want to have short-term rentals. So they're not separate. They're, they're actually quite, uh, quite um, tied together. We are here to make tough decisions, but more importantly, we're here to make good decisions. Sometimes the good decisions are tough decisions, but it's more important for us to make good decisions. And I don't want councillors to think that the wording of the amendment that I suggested is going to provide, necessarily going to provide cover for council, because it may not. It may very well be that we're going to create 130 new uh, short-term licenses in locations where we may find a number of them uh, are in areas that we don't think they should be located. We don't know that, and so we're making a bit of a, a, a leap. And yes, it may not be 130 applications or whatever the difference is. We don't know that either. So that um, these are all um, variables that uh, cause me concern when I make a decision because I want to make a good decision. I want to make a good decision on the most information that I can get. And, you know, I, I heard the argument about, about the businesses, and I, I agree with that. I understand that if we want to encourage and promote business, we have to make sure that there are customers available. And short-term rentals do provide the opportunity for a number of businesses. But let's not, let's not kid ourselves as to some of the perhaps unintended consequences of short-term rentals. Properties have been acquired in town um, for prices far in excess of what the local market would have paid so that there has been an impact on the market uh, prices. Uh, that's because a lot of these houses that are being acquired for short-term rentals aren't being purchased by individuals. They're being purchased by investors. Um, so for them, this is a commercial activity. This isn't a residential activity. And there may be some positive benefits for the community. Uh, I don't deny that. But let's not forget that there's also a flip side of that. And then the other item that I, I, I fall back on which I'd mentioned before, is that people in this community rely upon the zoning bylaws. They rely upon certain things being permitted in certain areas. Um, and um, the vast majority of residents have, have indicated that you know, they're living in a neighborhood that they think should be utilized for residential purposes, not necessarily, necessarily commercial. And short-term rentals are a commercial use, for sure. We do have the ability to regulate um, that type of activity, and that may be another tool that we'll be able to utilize at some point down the road. But um, I, I think that, you know, we're, for the sake of moving this issue forward a month, I think we're creating some challenges for ourselves. So I'm, as I said before, I'm not going to support this. I would like a recorded vote, though, Chair. Can I speak to the, oh, Councillor Flack. I just felt I should weigh in, uh, put on public record. I, uh, I won't support the motion for the main, uh, main reason that I feel that we made this decision to wait until the 29th of May. And I just feel that there's a creative end around to, uh, to have that vote um, um, re reconsidered. So uh, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not completely opposed to, uh, to the motion itself, just for the way that it was presented. And I won't support the motion because of that. Thank you. Councillor Noyes. Well, thank you, Councillor McDermott. And um, just to re basically ditto what uh, Councillor Flagg just said, too, is that we had this on, we had this before us, was it last week or the week before? Yes, we did. You, had a, you had something mm. that came forward, and it was defeated. But, but anyway, um, that you wanted to move the date up, which was all part of this. Um, but anyway, and having said that, I, I guess the, the, the thing I wrote down is that you, um, one of the councillors said that we, we need to make a balanced, open, and transparent, that our decisions should be balanced, open, and transparent. I don't know how bringing this forward tonight 
after we agreed to wait for the land use study, which basically decides where places can and can't be, that we were not going to move that forward, um, you know, uh, that how having this tonight is open, transparent, um, and balanced. I, I just don't see it. I think it, it's a shame, but it is what it is. And I understand that people are frustrated with the timing. I'm frustrated with the timing. Um, and I wish it all happened faster, but I don't like the way this is coming down. Thank you. Councilor Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm only going to jump in because the question was asked while Councilor Noyes was looking directly at me, even though Councilor uh, Christensen moved the motion. Um, with respect to the open and transparent aspect, how does having a moratorium in place that prohibits the 250 licenses that Council previously agreed to and not allow for the infilling of that arbitrary number to be filled? Secondly, I have heard from people who, and I'll give you an example, someone who owns two homes in the community, one is a short-term rental, the other is their permanent residence. They have a license to operate their short-term rental. They move into their short-term rental because they're improving their permanent residence. They have no ability to park their license. They would have to give up their license or pay for a license in a year where they have no ability to do that. And I don't find that helpful. I think it's problematic. And I, I, I ask the same question back in the, uh, in the essence of transparency, balance, and openness. How is having an arbitrary cap that cannot be met meeting what you're arguing? Let's call the question. Yeah. Okay, let's call the question then. All in favor? Recorded vote. I'm oh, you want a recorded vote. Uh, Madam Clark. Councillor Christensen. Councillor Lewis. Yes, in support of the motion. Councillor Flagg. Opposed to the motion. Councillor Dubineau. Yes. Councillor Noyes. No. Councillor McDermott. Yes. Mayor Redekop. No. The vote carries. Back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor McDermott. Um, Councillor Noyes, you said that you also had a notice of motion you wanted to bring forward? Yeah, yes, I do. Um, I want to bring a notice of motion in regards to the the height of fences um, in residential areas that that go to the waterfront, basically that limiting it um, to a certain height. Um, I'm I don't need to discuss it more tonight, right? But <laughs> but anyway, just uh, basically the height of fences that end at the water that end at the waterfront. Thank you. And so in your motion, you will, you will define what you mean by waterfront? Okay. Uh, and that's returnable when? Vote. May the 29th? That's fine. Yep. Any other notices of motion? Madam Clerk, I have a notice of motion with res which will be returnable May the 29th as well, and that's that staff be directed to provide council with a memo regarding bylaw 60-04, being a bylaw to regulate the destruction, injury, and harvesting of trees in the town of Fort Erie with respect to the following. Um, the memo would address, one, the resources necessary to implement enforcement of the bylaw. Two, the coordination, if any, with the region of Niagara that would be necessary or advisable when the town begins enforcement of the bylaw. Three, whether part five is a necessary uh, part or should be repealed. Four, updating the cost of a permit, five, if violation can be enforced by administrative monetary penalty, and six, a projected date to commence enforcement of the bylaw. If there are no other notices of motion, then that takes us to bylaws, and um, bylaw 60, sorry, bylaw 73, 2023 has to be removed from the package because Councillor Flagg has 
a uh, pecuniary interest with respect to that. And um, I would like uh, bylaw 67 2023 also removed from the package. So, Councillor Lewis, you have first and second reading of the bylaw package. Uh, perhaps you could proceed with 67 and 73 left out for the moment. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Noyes that the bylaw package containing 58 2023 to authorize the entry into a license agreement for Crystal, the Crystal Beach Business Improvement Area Board of Management, Farmers Market, Zero Erie Road, 59 2023, being a bylaw to amend fees and charges, bylaw number 40 09. As amended, building permit, lot grading review, fill and site alterations, plumbing and sign permit fees. 60-2023 to exempt a certain plan or certain block in part 59M-438 part lot control Village Creek Drive, Block 59, Village Creek Subdivision, Park Lane Home Builders Limited, Debbie Hill. 61 dash zero or 61 2023 to amend bylaw number 12990 as amended 20 229 cherry hill boulevard south 10001126 ontario inc john lally 62 dash 2203 to provide for drainage works in the town of Fort Erie for Frenchman's Creek drain, first and second only, provisional. 632023 to enact an amendment to the official plan adopted by bylaw number 150 06 for the town of Fort Erie planning area amendment number 70 3011 Point Avenue Road North, Matthew Erickson and Kelsey Sutherland owners. 64-2023 to amend zoning bylaw number 12990 as amended 3011 Point Avenue Road North, Matthew Erickson and Kelsey Sutherland owners. 65-2023 to enact an amendment to the official plan adopted by bylaw number 150-06 for the Town of Fort Erie Planning Area Amendment number 71, 644 Garrison Road, 235048 Ontario Limited, Ken Koo, owner, and 662023 to amend bylaw number 12990 as amended, 644 Garrison Road, 235048 Ontario Limited, Ken Koo, owner, 68 2023 to reestablish at the Accessibility Advisory Committee terms of reference and repeal bylaw number 171 2002, 150-05 and 177-06, 69-2023 to adopt the terms of reference for the Committee of Adjustment, 70-2023 to establish the Museum and Cultural Heritage Committee adopt terms of reference and repeal bylaw number 35-12, 71-2023 to adopt the terms of reference for the Property Standards Committee, 72-2023 to reestablish the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee and repeal bylaw number 23-10 and 158-2021. Uh, 74-2023 to adopt a neighborhood traffic calming policy and repeal bylaw number 199-140 is given first and second reading. Thank you. All those in favor? And opposed that is carried. Those bylaws in the package are on the floor for any questions or comments. Councillor Noyes. Yes, I did want to comment on 62-2023, the drainage work for the Frenchman's Creek drain. Um, I do have some concerns, but I also I've discussed some of them with staff um, after the after it was presented to us. I understand that um, even though I would like to do something, I can't do it um, because I, miss, I know Mr. Jerkowski was talking about the um, the, the quarry the, the, and the amount of water, et cetera, et cetera. But I did talk to uh, the staff, and that cannot have any bearing really on the Frenchman's Creek drainage report. Um, but I do want to point out that. 
Um, one of the things that this, the drainage engineer did point out, that it is up to the town to maintain the drain based on complaints of or concerns addressed by the residents. And that was the first time that I've heard that. I've always heard it's up to the residents to, to maintain their drain. Now we're told that all the residents have to do is call the town, and the town has to maintain the drain. So um, I think this is a different way that we've looked at it, and it'll be interesting to see how this goes down the creek. No pun intended. <laughs> Any uh, other questions or comments? If not, then Councillor Noyes, you have uh, third and final reading for the bylaw package. That is less 67 and 73. Except for 67 and 73. Mm -hmm. Moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Dubino that the bylaw package containing 58 2023, 59 2023, 60 2023, 61 2023, 63 2023, 64 2023, 65 2023, 66 2023, 68 2023, 69 2023, 70 2023, 71 2023, 72 2023, 74 2023 is given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Are there any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Councillor Lewis, back to you with respect to um, bylaw 67, which um, proposes the dissolution of the Fort Erie Active Transportation Committee. Thank you, and do you want me to do all 73 separate as well? Or Separately, okay. yes. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Noyes that the bylaw package containing 67 dash 2023 to dissolve the Fort Erie Transportation Committee and repeal bylaw number 44-1096-2013 and 128-2014. Thank uh, you. Is given first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed, that is carried. That bylaw is on the floor for any questions or comments. Councillor Noyes. Thank you, Mayor. This uh this did come up at our last accessibility committee because I think one, if not two, of our members sit on the active transportation and they were surprised that this was going to be dissolved. But at the same point, it was explained to them that the purpose of the 40-year active transportation committee was to was to get a, a, a master plan in regards to this issue. And the master plan has been completed, so they have basically fulfilled the, the mandate when why the committee was established in the first place. So, um, and also that if there is an issue or whatever with accessibility or whatever, that um, it would still be addressed by accessibility. But um, they, you know, so I guess that's it. But the, again, the purpose of the committee was to, to establish a master plan, which is now complete. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Herlovich, um, sorry that I, I didn't, couldn't ask you this beforehand, but do you have any engagement with the transportation, active transportation committee? I do not. Um, are there any, maybe Mr. Waltz, are there any plans for expansion of um, recreation trail in, in the community? Um, one of the rec recommendations when the, uh, when the plan was adopted in principle uh, a couple of years ago or more, uh, was to bring a report back to council on uh, the financing strategy. There's, well, after inflation, there's probably 10 or $12 million worth of works in there now that are uh, uh, not identified in any of our capital plans. So um, the, the intent is for staff to bring a report back uh, outlining our, our, our options for financing this. And until... Uh, uh, the complete plan is in place, which includes the dollar signs. Uh, there's nothing planned. Um, and Madam Clerk, I haven't been following necessarily all the minutes here. And uh, have we had difficulties with quorum with the active transportation? So that perhaps, yes, your worship, and that's perhaps the reason, I guess, for the recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. That uh, then takes us to third and final reading for bylaw 67, Councillor Noyes, if you'd be so good. Yes, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Dubino that bylaw number 67, 2023 is given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? That is carried. 
Councillor Lewis, back to you then with respect to bylaw 73. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Noyes, a bylaw package containing 73-2023 to exempt a certain plan block in Plan 59M-488 from part lot control, Williams Crescent, Block 39, Peace Bridge Village, Phase 2, Ashton Homes, Western Limited, Jason Gilmore, is given first and second reading. All those in favor? That is carried. Um, any questions or comments? If not, Councillor Noyes, third and final reading, please. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Dubineau that bylaw number 73 2023 is given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Uh, any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Councillor Flagg, that takes us to you with respect to the confirmatory bylaw. Thank you, Your Worship. The bylaw number 75 2023, I'm sorry, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Dubino. The bylaw number 75 2023 to confirm the action of the council at its special council meeting held on March the 31st, 2023. Council committee meetings held on April the 3rd, 2023 and April 17th, 2023. And the council meeting held on April 24th, 2023 is given first and second reading. All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Councillor Christensen, third and final reading, please. Can't hand it back there till it's passed. Okay. Keep an eye on Councillor Lewis. He shuffles papers. <laughs> this is resolution number 15. Councillor Lewis, just hand this down. Um, moved by me, seconded by Councillor Lewis, that bylaw number 75 2023 is given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and clerk under the corporate seal. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. Thank you. That takes us to scheduling of meetings. Councillor Dubineau. Yeah, Your Worship. It's it's not really a, a meeting so much, but I, I just want to share it with the community. The uh, the Heritage um, Advisory Committee, um, one of the subcommittees that deals with uh, heritage designations on properties. Um, the Reform Committee are starting to go out and do their. Um, examinations of some of the candidate properties that's beginning this week. Um, I just wanted to share that because it's a very important issue, especially with Bill 23 and some of the challenges we have with our uh, heritage register and, and getting some of those properties designated. I believe there's two or three that we're going to be getting to this week. Um, I'm trying to get out to one as a new councillor just to find out the, uh, the work that they do. And uh, I just wanted to share that we've got a very, very busy work plan um, over the next year over the next uh, two years, extending along Bill 23 as well for the rest of the term. So uh, I just wanted to share that, Your Worship. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. Just want to mention um, for public meetings, there is a Point Avenue Road reconstruction meeting, which will be on Wednesday, April the 26th, from 3 until 6 p.m. at Fire Hall number 4. And I know that is something that you and I worked quite hard to get um, moved up for the residents. And thank you, Mr. Walsh. Yeah, and Mr. Walsh has indicated that the consultant or rep will be available for that meeting. Yeah, thank you very much. Councilor McDermott? Uh, yes, tomorrow night I have a Bridgeburg BIA meeting. And what time is that? Is that 6 p.m.? 6 o'clock. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Christensen, do you have your hand up? Yes, uh, Your Worship. Um, on um, Wednesday, May the 3rd, there's a Seniors Advisory Committee at Douglas Heights Seniors Active Living Centre at 10 a.m. And uh, the same day at 5.30 p.m., the Ridgeway BIA meets at the Centennial Ridge Library. Thank you. And also, we have a uh, training, council training session uh, with respect to the code of, conflict, code of Conduct and Conflict of Interest on uh, Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and that is here at Town Hall. Um, Councillor Noyes? I just wanted to mention, it's not really a meeting, but it, there's a grand opening ceremony at the Stevensville Animal Hospital um, on Airline Street at 10 o'clock on Saturday. That's correct. 
Uh, there being no other meetings to announce, Councillor Dubino. Yes, Your Worship. And uh, one one day, Councillor Christopher said you'll realize you put you you make sure you got the papers first because eventually you're going to get called. <laughs> Um, uh, move, uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Flagg that Council adjourns at 9.30 p.m. to reconvene into a regular meeting of Council on May 26, 2023. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you.